are recorded as mentioned previously, or you can register in advance to speak during the meeting. If you wish to comment, sorry, if you wish to provide comment during the public comment opportunities found under items six and nine, you're asked to register in advance by contacting the corporate officer at corporateofficer at summerland.ca with following information. Uh, name, civic address, method of participation, in-person telephone or Zoom, and you will be provided further details upon registration. And lastly, if you haven't uh, registered in advance, you can request to speak during the meeting, um, time permitting. After I've provided everybody who has pre-registered with an opportunity to comment, the floor will be open to those in council chambers and those on the conference line. The conference line can be accessed by dialing 778-907-2071 and entering meeting ID 506-489-9374 and passcode 485186. Are there any late items to introduce? No. Okay, so we'll move on to approval of the agenda. Could I have someone bring forward the uh, Resolution to adopt the agenda. Councillor Van Elfen, Councillor Trainer, all in favor? Thank you. And adoption of the minutes from the regular meeting of October the 25th, the afternoon meeting, and October the 28th special council meeting. Councillor Van Elfen, Councillor Patton, all in favor? Thank you. Okay. Next up on our agenda is uh, 5.1, Peter Robinson, who is going to be presenting on behalf of the Community Energy Association, uh, the 2021 Climate and Energy Action Award for Corporate Operations. Please go ahead when you're ready, Peter. Uh, thank you so much, Moot and, uh, and Council. So I'd just like to say um, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, of course, many of you will recognize me, um, even though I'm speaking remotely, of course. So I'd like to say it is a delight to virtually uh, get together with you and celebrate the Climate and Energy Action Award win for the District of Summerland. So I'm very pleased to be here representing CEA, the Community Energy Association, the province of BC, UBCM, Fortis BC, BC Hydro, and the Real Estate Foundation of BC, as I congratulate Mayor Tony Boot and all councillors and also all the District of Summerland staff on the District of Summerland receiving a Climate and Energy Action Award in the Corporate Operations category for its leadership in low carbon and renewable energy project implementation. So CEA was pleased to announce the award during the UBCM convention on September 14th. And just quickly, I mean, you'll probably, many of you will remember this, but I'll just share some quick context about Community Energy Association that we are a member-based non-profit organization working since 1995 at the community level to reduce emissions, conserve energy, and progressively transition to a low carbon and resilient economy. And one of the ways we do this is by recognizing local government achievements through the Climate and Energy Action Awards. So since 1998, the Climate and Energy Action Awards have celebrated the many ways local governments across BC have helped their communities save energy, emissions, and money. Whether big or small, urban or rural, north and south, CEA recognizes all communities bringing innovative climate and energy solutions to the table. And the awards are only one way that CEA uh, helps communities with climate action. And so, for example, uh, the District of Sunland and CEA, we've worked together in the past multiple times. We worked together, obviously, to deliver Summerland's Community Energy Emissions Plan, uh, the Community Energy Emissions Reduction Plan, it was called. Also the Corporate Energy and Emissions Management Plan. Uh, we worked on uh, the Okanagan Energy Diets. I've presented council on the BC Energy Step Code before, and we've done other community engagements and outreach as well. Uh, for example, a community presentation on solar, as some of you may recall. We also worked together on helping the District of Summerland um, move through the milestones of the Partners for Climate Protection Program. And of course, the district has been a member of CEA's membership network since 2018. So we thank our sponsors of the 2021 Climate and Energy Action Awards, who are UBCM, Province of BC, Real Estate Foundation, Fortis and BC Hydro. Um, and so from an array of strong and innovative nominations, the independent judging panel 
selected the District of Samaland to win the 2021 Climate and Energy Action Award in the Corporate Operations category. Evaluation criteria included the quantitative and qualitative results, demonstrated community leadership, and best practices and innovation. And so what I have written here, um, which is that the district's low carbon and renewable energy project implementation was a clear winner. The district applied with a clear and concise narrative showing measurable successes and a wide array of actions and benefits. It singles out here the Green Revolving Fund is an innovative approach and the application focused heavily on the implementation of actions. Additionally, Summerland demonstrated outstanding leadership from elected officials and staff. And, uh, you know, just reading through your application just before, uh, before this call, it's really, really impressive. So obviously it's incredibly impressive to see the, you know, the work on the one megawatt solar PV farm, also the battery, the associated battery storage project, um, that all 12 of your biggest buildings have received ASHRAE level two energy audits and the ongoing implementation of actions within those buildings. So for example, heat pumps, the high efficiency HVAC equipment, thermal insulation, reflective sustainable roofing materials, and the list just goes on and on. It's absolutely incredible. You have solar on some of your municipal buildings, 22 kilowatts. Um, as a result of the adjustments for net metering program, you now have um, over just two years, customers within Summerland have gone from just six residential solar installations to almost 50. And that alone is almost 400 kilowatts of solar photovoltaics installed within the community of Summerland now. And you know, I'm not reading out everything here in the application, but it's really substantial. And especially for communities the size of Summerland, and this is just you know, staggering progress that um, you know, deserves to be awarded in, uh, in every way, I would say. So please note that the winning projects, including this one, will be highlighted in the December 2021 edition of the Municipal World Magazine. And the summary of all of the winners was presented uh, in a virtual celebration video and, um, and maybe there's a way I can share the link uh, perhaps later, but we have on our web page, we have an awards page and you'll see a short video. It's only about five minutes long and the District of Summerland is celebrated in that video. So again, on behalf of Community Energy Association and our co-sponsors, I congratulate you on your inspiring achievement. This award is, a, is an essential celebration of your success at this point in the journey. I hope to have the pleasure to present future awards to the district to celebrate ongoing leadership in climate action. And I now invite Mayor Tony Booth and Council to receive the District of Summerland's 2021 Climate and Energy Action Award for Corporate Operations. Great, thank you, Peter. It certainly is an honor to win this award. And although you couldn't be here in person, Carly has organized us to receive this in advance. And I would pass it around, but protocol probably doesn't allow it. Uh, this will have a place of prominence in our municipal hall because this is quite an achievement for the District of Summerland. And although, just for your, for your um, knowledge, although we have lost um, Ms. Tammy Rothery to your organization, so kudos to you. Um, Council is still committed, of course, to uh, having these initiatives that impact our changing climate in a positive way. And uh, Mr. Stat announced, I don't know, two, two weeks, three, four weeks ago, that uh, there is another person joining the organization that will try at least to fill uh, Tam uh, Tammy's shoes in that role. So thank you again for this award. It's uh, it's absolutely fabulous, and um, I'm thanking you on behalf of Council and the District of Summerland as a whole. Thank you so much, Mayor Boots, and uh, to all of Council. And uh, it's always a pleasure to uh, to present to the District of Summerland. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today. Okay, is there anybody on the line? I don't see anyone in the gallery, no. Okay, thank you. 
So moving on to the first of a few business items, 7.1, fees and charges, Schedule F, business license fees, amendment bylaw number 2021-046. Mr. Dolovit. Thank you, Worship. It's gonna wait for the presentation slides to come online. <clears throat> okay, um, I'm here before council today to discuss our uh, current business license fees uh, within our Schedule F, it's referred to, of our fees and charges bylaw. And uh, we're also proposing uh, an amendment bylaw um, number 2021-046 be considered uh, by District Council this afternoon. Not working, sorry. Um, so some background uh, of council members last year around this, around this time, uh, in the preparation of the 2021 budget, there was some discussions with council in regards to the a review of our business license fees and and completing a benchmark comparison to other municipalities and staff advised council at that point in time that it may be too late for the 2021 budget year however we could uh, bring this forward uh, as a an action item in the fall of 2021 uh, prior to implementation of the 2022 budget um, and inclusion in the 2022 budget and so that's why we are now back in front of council today um, before we uh, finalize the 2022 budget. Um, uh, we want to discuss with council the, our business license fee structure. Uh, we've also completed that benchmark comparison as well. So we're ready to have that discussion with council. Um, in January of 2021, following uh, that discussion uh, and due to the impact of COVID-19, um, the district council decided to waive the requirement for payment of a business license fee um, uh, in January. Um, and uh, and so subsequently, uh, the district staff, uh, we provided refunds to, uh, or a deferral of payment to all businesses that had already paid by that point, because renewals go out uh, around this time uh, uh, every year, um, their, their 2021 business license fee. So we have a portion of businesses that have actually chosen the deferral route uh, to the uh, 2022 year. Uh, and uh, in 2022, uh, we are expecting that the appropriate uh, business license fee in our schedule uh, with in accordance with our fees and charges bylaw will be applied in the renewal of licenses unless Council directs us otherwise, um, because that, that waiver was for only the annual year in 2021. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is our current Schedule F. Uh, some of the items included within it, um, it's referred to as our business uh, classifications and, and license fees um, schedule. Um, and. The, the inclusion of classifications is important um, right now as part of this schedule because there's a number of, of specific uh, license uh, classifications that are differentiated in, our, in the current Schedule F with uh, definitions for each classification. And I'll, I'll mention uh, that moving forward. Um, so pictured here in this, in this table is just a subset of the total different type of classifications. And you can see just as an example, there are various um, methods of, of calculating the fee uh, for each classification type. Um, some dependent on the number of persons, as it is for uh, real estate or, or profession of some sort. Uh, uh, some depending on the number of seats, as it is for restaurants. Some dependent on um, the square footage or square meters of a retail space. And, uh, and then also we also have different fees based on the total amount of, of liters sold of wine, um, surprisingly. Um, so we have a, a lot, quite a lot of differentiation and a lot of variation in terms of the fees that were charged. However, I do wanna state that in reviewing all of the license fees that we are, are, have issued um, and, the, and collected, the majority uh, are all subject to the standard license fee uh, amount of $175 currently. 
So although we have a, a lot of variation in classifications, most of our uh, business license businesses in town are subject to, to that standard license fee of 175. Um, next slide, please. Brad, yeah. uh, Councillor Trainer has a question. Oh, thank you. Sorry. This may be a silly question, but what is body rub? Is it is it like an auto body? No, it's oh. it's like a personal <laughs> body massage. Oh, it is. Rub, yeah. Is it like, okay? So is it like physio or like a massage? Like? Yeah, I don't know. It's kind of a historical uh, okay. classification that I think used to be uh, included in here, and, and actually used to I think historically it used to be an, an enforcement issue and oh, so I that's see. why it was it was charged it's so much category with painting it was i think body painting if ever oh. we ever ha had a body painting business in town they would be subject to this fee okay i've never seen that before so yeah. thank you <laughs> problem <laughs> I have a question as sure. well now that we're asking we'll, questions. Yeah. Um, is retail, does that incorporate the uh, cannabis retail outlets that we have in Summerland? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, Your Worship. No, it does not. We have a separate uh, license fee for retail store licensed cannabis stores, um, which I'll actually talk about here you know, coming up in the presentation. One other question. Sure. Um, I'm I'm wondering too. I noticed that you've got winery on there and a you know a, a volume amount. I'm wondering if uh, there is a license fee. No, never mind. No, I'm thinking of the chamber fee for for farms generally, not not a license fee. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'll keep moving forward. Uh, next slide. Thanks. So. Um, like what was discussed with council previously, we've completed a, a benchmark comparison uh, to other jurisdictions in the South Okanagan primarily um, for what they charge for their standard business license fee, um, as well as Kelowna was included in that just for comparison purposes. And you can see where right now the District of Summerland uh, ends up. We're uh, probably on the higher range here and looking at our other jurisdictions, um, only Penticton being higher at $185 per year. Um, we also have Kelowna and West Kelowna is kind of more the mid range in comparison to the, all the jurisdictions at 127 uh, for Kelowna and 135 for West Kelowna. And then we have on the lower end of the spectrum, we have some of the smaller municipalities, um, Peachland, Oliver and Asuyas being around the $100 mark uh, on average there. So, but that could be because they haven't recently updated their their, license, their fees and charges bylaws with respect to this um, review of these license fees. Next slide. So um, with regards to our proposed amendment bylaw number 2021-046, um, we're proposing a number of uh, changes of approach. Um, from the current Schedule F that I just presented. So uh, starting with the removal of classification definitions. So um, as mentioned, the current Schedule F has def definitions for each classification, but staff were r uh, running into uh, interpretation issues with the definition within the schedule not lining up with our other definitions and other uh, bylaws of the district, including the, the district's zoning bylaw. Um, as well as the business licensing regulation bylaw. Um, so just as an example, um, there was definitions for a, a home occupation type one and type two uh, within the schedule that were actually the opposite of how they are defined in um, the zoning bylaw where the type one was a, a smaller business, a desk and telephone primarily uh, in the zoning bylaw. Um, and uh, no additional storage space, um, but a type two, it allows for a larger space within your home as well as use of your accessory building, a garage for a home-based business. Um, uh, while this, the definitions within Schedule F, um, the, uh, the type two was the smaller version. It was a $50 fee uh, of just a reduced space and um, a, 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 a uh, sorry, like a desk and telephone, again, 
while the type one was a larger uh, space and, and therefore a larger fee related to it. So that definitely created issues for us in reviewing home occupations, you can imagine, um, on, on which fee we should be applying. Um, as well, uh, there were inconsistencies with uh, ch uh, day homes, um, as another example, um, which we, we had different restrictions on the size of the day home before it hit a, uh, a larger fee charge, So, which was, again, different than our zoning bylaws. So we're proposing to remove those definitions from the schedule. We don't, administratively, we don't think it's the right spot for definitions to be included in the fees and charges bylaw. And rather, if there is definitions for the, the different classifications that they should be found in other bylaws, like the zoning bylaw, where it's a sp specific use, or the business licensing uh, and regulation bylaw. And so for that was one of our recommended approaches. Um, just hit the next button, please. The other recommended approach was also reduction of the different t classification types. Um, you can see that in their current schedule off, we had a number of different types of classification types, including body rub parlors um, and other types of uh, business uh, classifications that um, were really in looking at other uh, jurisdictions, maybe we did not need to have separated out from the standard license fee. Uh, in looking at all the other uh, fees and charges bylaws of our uh, South Okanagan, only us and the city of Kelowna maintain such a large a plethora of, of classification types. Um, most other jurisdictions, like Asuius and Penticton, um, had pretty much used the standardized uh, business license fee. It did not include the different classification types, except for specific reasons, and I'll get into some of our recommendations. So that was another thing too, and we think that it'll help with administrative administration of business license fees and not having to manually uh, calculate the fee uh, for a different uh, calculation type each time, as well as um, provide ease for the public in determining what fee is gonna be charged to them for their business license fee. Next one. And then finally, our, our third recommendation here for uh, Amendment Bylaw 2021-46 is to reduce the fee for the standard business license fee. And looking at our at our juris comparison jurisdictions, we were on the upper end of the spectrum. Um, we think the reduced rate of $125 is probably a more balanced approach for the district moving forward, um, and it's in line with West Kelowna and Kelowna. Next slide. So here's our proposed amended bylaw schedule. Um, for Schedule F, will be a, uh, what we're proposing is a repeal and replacement of the current Schedule F. Um, you can see that some of the uh, current classification types have been carried forward into this table, primarily to do with the tourism sector. Um, so just to list them here, agritourism accommodation, which was a new inclusion just past July, bed and breakfast, uh, hotel, motels and campgrounds, and also retail store licensed cannabis is proposed to um, remain. Uh, and usually these tourism oriented businesses are uh, at a little bit higher rate than our standard license fee. Question? Thank you, Madam Mayor. So mm -hmm. your uh, campgrounds, like including the three spots on farmland? That would fall under the agritourism accommodation license. Um, okay. So it'd be the $100 charge. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'll keep moving forward. Um, we also are recommending that we still keep um, a reduced fee for those business types that we want to encourage uh, small uh, form entrepreneurship and small businesses, um, such as uh, home occupation type ones, as I previously identified, um, day homes up to seven kids within your within your day home, uh, as well as fruit stands as a new inclusion at a reduced rate fee of $50 to encourage um, those type of agribusinesses um, to uh, locate here within the district. And then uh, finally, we there's a few additional uh, cl uh, classifications added here uh, that weren't in our schedule before, uh, movie production being one that's, that we were recommending at uh, a higher rate than our standard license fee because we're, we feel that this is a, 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 
a new kind of impact that we're seeing within our community. Um, we're, we are getting a lot of demand for movies being produced within our, our district. Uh, and, and definitely there is an impact to our, our, uh, our local businesses as well as through road closures of residential areas as, as another example where uh, we think that they should be subjected to a higher license fee. Um, the seasonal uh, fee has been added as well for, for primarily tourist oriented businesses that operate only from May till September uh, during the tourism season. So it's a reduced fee for a, a seasonal business. And then um, uh, we also have a special event license, um, which is a per day rate that we're proposing for a wedding uh, event or a, fest a festival of some sort being held here in town uh, for a weekend or some sort of uh, other type of thing that requires only a daily rate for uh, a license. Yeah. Next slide. Um, and then finally here, before we get into questions, uh, our finance department, um, oh, actually I have one more slide following this. Uh, our finance department provided a revenue analysis of the impacts of these changes with the new schedule. And uh, we looked at the 2019 year, uh, so because that was the last year we had without COVID-19 uh, impacts. We received a, a total of $152,000 in revenue. Um, if we would have uh, reduced the classification types as well as reduced the standard fee amount to $125, um, we would have expected to see a revenue of $116,000 as opposed to $152,000. Uh, this was this is a reduction of thirty seven thousand um, dollars. However, I do want to mention that we we are experiencing growth in in the number of business licenses issued, so that should offset some of that uh, impact. Um, and then our finance department as well uh, mentioned that to council that if if uh, because we did issue deferrals uh, in the last uh, uh, business license renewal year uh, to 2022. Um, any outstanding amounts, uh, if the, the fee is reduced uh, with this proposed amendment, there might it might not sync with the amount that was uh, deferred from 2021. So we might have to defer um, a portion of their license fee uh, to the to the next year, being 2023. If um, if uh, we if it's a different fee than what was charged in 2021. Next slide. And finally, um, we did present these amendments uh, to the Development Process Improvement Advisory Committee on October 20th. Um, comments from the committee included support for further standardization of the classification types to make it easier for the business community to interpret as well as to not pu punish business growth um, was one of their comments. Um, as well, they also support the reduced standard fee uh, and feel the $125 amount is a balanced approach. And so they provided a resolution of support. Next slide. So our recommendation is if uh, council supports the proposed amendments that they provide uh, three readings uh, today's meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. Council, do you have questions or further questions? Councillor Holmes. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for this, uh, Brad. I, um, I I certainly agree with the the idea of having of standardizing the fees and consolidating the classifications as much as possible. And I I, I was just wondering, uh, I guess maybe some of the rationale for the different fees and different classifications. So uh, just to put it in context, so so when when we discussed the. Uh, the retail cannabis, when that first came to us, for example, it was kind of an unknown quantity. We didn't know what the impact would be. And and we thought there might be more um, regulation involved, more potentially RCMP time, more, more staff time of our staff time. And so that's the way we kind of thought we, it should be a higher than a normal uh, just retail uh, business license fee. And I don't know if that's now that we've had some time behind us, if that's in fact the case or not. Um, and and then some of the other fees here, so like the different tourism fees for more per room, uh, childcare, you know, minor and major. Is that because um, 
those require would be requiring more inspections and more you know is there more regulations that we need to deal with to justify the different fees or are there some other rationale yeah through the no, your worship to councillor holmes um maybe i'll start with the first one there uh, retail store licensed cannabis um, definitely we're willing to consider any recommendations from council on this one. Um, I, I wasn't here at the time when, when the, these bylaw amendments were brought forward for a retail store licensed cannabis. It was done a few years ago. Um, I, I, I think a lot of jurisdictions at the time, like you said, were, were cautious with implementation of the changes and, and most did include a, a higher rate for cannabis stores. Um, I, 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 you know, I can't speak on behalf of the RCMP. I don't think we've had a lot of complaints. Um, at least from the bylaw enforcement side, uh, um, for the operation of those stores. Um, and uh, I think they're heavily regulated through LCRB, um, the Liquor Control uh, uh, Board. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, um, there may not be the justification of it, um, but that could be something that we'd like to get a recommendation from council on. And then uh, the other ones there, um, the, uh, the agritourism accommodation and bed and breakfast is the per room charge. We think that there is a larger impact to the surrounding neighborhood um, where those uh, businesses are located, the larger the, the um, operation. Um, that's why there is a larger fee for, for greater than three or two bedrooms. Um, you know, you could get a fairly large bed and breakfast, for example, um, which has an impact. So they should be subject to a larger fee. Um, um, for child care centers and also home occupations. The reason why there's differentiated type stairs is because we wanted to encourage that reduced fee for the smaller form of, of those. So um, if you look at the major, it's $125, which is for, the, for a child care center, which is our standard fee. Um, but then a reduced rate just to kind of show that there's um, uh, the smaller form version we're trying to encourage. Um, and uh, same with home occupations type ones, if that makes sense. So the thought process then is that, so you have $125, that's your standard fee, your, your, your standard business. If, if it's a, a greater than the normal impact, um, then you, you put a premium on that. If it's something then you want to uh, incur, a sort of thing you want to encourage, then you have a, reduc a reduction. Would yeah, that be clear yet that's in that, that's correct. I would think uh, um, we look at um, the the neighborhoods that these facilities are going in, like this bed and breakfasts, and even the agritourism accommodation, child care center, minors and majors, home occupations. They're in residential areas. They're not in commercial districts. Not being taxed commercial taxation. Um, they 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 could have an impact on the surrounding neighborhood. That they're located in, so they should be treated a bit differently than a standard business. Councillor Van Elphin. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I was wondering if could you tell us what a liquor store license would be? They would be subject to the standard rate of $125 from us, but they would be also be required to get their own license from the LCRB for li selling a liquor. So cannabis would be the same. They would have to have a license from us and from the That's government. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Um, please go ahead, and then Councillor Patton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I just want to throw it out to Council if this is the appropriate time that we reduce the uh, retail store license cannabis to match what the liquor stores are paying. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Van Elfen. Councillor Patton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, right now, the fee for uh, a cannabis shop, uh, the license fee is $400, is it not? So we're not making, we're not doing anything to the cannabis store, but maintaining what we currently are seeing. Yeah, through the mayor to Council Patton, that's correct. Yeah, we're just carrying forward the current license fee of $400 that's in our schedule. Thank you. Because um, if I'm not mistaken, I think Penticton's $2,500. I think Vernon's 2000 I believe Kelowna 
is well over $9,000 or somewhere in there. So I don't think $400 is out of line for a cannabis shop in, in Summerland. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Councillor Patton. Um, Councillor Holmes. Yeah, just, I, I guess, you know, I think we do need to recognize cannabis is a bit more of an administrative burden for us because we do have to process those. They, they do have to come to us. So I think, you know, a biz, a, a, them paying a little bit more than a standard fee would make some sense because we have to, uh, you know, it's more work for us and staff. Um, you know, $2,000 might be a bit much. <laughs> Any other questions, Council? No? Okay, would someone like to bring forward a resolution or an amended resolution? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That the fees and charges amendment bylaw number 2021-046 get schedule F business license fees be read a first, second, and third time. Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Holmes. Any further discussion? Call the question. All in favor? And none opposed. Thank you. Now on to 7.2, Water Advisory Committee, Terms of Reference Amendments. And this is for Kendra. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, before Council has proposed amendments to the Water Advisory Committee Terms of Reference, these amendments include a clause requiring committee members to undertake any training as required by the district, including bullying and harassment, and adding a clause to require two additional staff members, both the Director of Works and Infrastructure and the Director of Utilities, to attend meetings and other general housekeeping amendments, such as updating the Council Procedure Bylaw number in the Terms of Reference. Thanks, Kendra. Any questions of our corporate officer? Okay, I'd like to invite someone to bring forward their resolution. Councillor Holmes. Um, sorry, I just wanted to, um, well, first of all, just a minor thing, but it's not park anymore. It's, um, it's the Summerlin Research uh, Center. So that would be just a pretty minor amendment, I think. Um, my, my only question on, on the membership is I, I see that, you know, we've changed it so it should represent these, these groups, but um, I, I, I'm just wondering how useful it is to have those listed there kind of as, you know, in stone when, when the reality is when we get applications, you know, we tend to choose the best people wherever they come from. And, and if we end up with, you know, three tree fruit people and we can't find a, uh, a nursery or a hay pasture person, you know, that's what we go with. So I, I'm just wondering, you know, is, uh, is, that, is that list of, of the different groups really necessary? Uh, through the chair, thank you, Councillor Holmes. So that is why we added the word should, uh, and staff is sitting down further to review these terms of reference. So I do expect that they will be coming before council again, with the membership being one of the things that will be reviewed and considered. Councillor Barkwell. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I, I understand uh, Councillor Holmes' point and uh, agree with uh, our staff's choice of using the word should. We don't always get people from the various sectors of the agriculture community. So leaving it there just as a reminder that we, although we probably don't need that reminder, but it doesn't do any harm to be there that we want to try and have a broad section of the different types of agriculture on the committee where possible. So it doesn't bind us in any way, but it serves as a reminder. Anyone else? Kendra, if you just um, might add the word uh, will. Very last sentence when it's speaking about the um, staff that will be available. Just a little teensy thing. 
And just uh, reiterating what Councillor Holmes said, just so you have it in full, Summerland Research and Development Center, so SRDC. Okay, anything else? We've been nitpicking this. Well, at least I have. Okay, could I have someone bring forward the um, recommendation, please? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor, that the Water Advisory Committee terms of reference be amended as outlined in the report from the corporate officer dated November 8, 2021. Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Van Elf, or sorry, Councillor Patton. Any further discussion? All in favor? And none opposed, thank you. Now on to the big piece, we're right on time. Quarterly report, sorry, quarterly update strategic priorities for Q3 of 2021. And this is going to be introduced by our CAO Graham Stat. All right, well, as that gets loaded, um, I will uh, start just by saying, uh, you know, in reminder, so for quarter three, that's ending uh, end of September of this year, 2021. So all of the updates you'll see today are in thinking of uh, that horizon. And uh, this serves sort of as council's dashboard on their priorities. Uh, we do like to come in and walk through all of the uh, various priorities, uh, one slide per each, and then talk about any updates. It's been a busy year. There's been a lot of transition in staff and of course, continuing challenges on other things from supply chains to, you know, issues associated with um, finding good vendors for some of our capital projects, but we've made a lot of progress. I'm very proud of uh, what we've seen up to and including quarter three. Uh, this first slide is council strategic priorities at a, at a very high level. So these five bullet or bubbles rather, infrastructure investment, good governance, community resilience, alternative energy, active lifestyles, and downtown vibrancy. And those sort of serve as the, the overarching kind of umbrellas that, that other priorities fall into. And so we'll go to the next slide. And really that's how the, you'll recall we've sorted uh, all the other individuals' priorities is under those, uh, those overarching headings. And so we'll be talking about all these priorities as we work through. You'll also note that we do have the Eco Village priority in the slides today as we've continued work uh, in that priority as well. And so without further ado, I'll move to priority 1.1, which is the asset management. It is 145 and that's great because we're starting right on time. And I hope we can get through all the slides today. So over to you, Madam Mayor, I guess, if you want to. All right. Thank you, uh, Graham. And I guess the first person that will be speaking is on asset management is Joe. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Yes, priority 1.1 .1 is uh, asset management. And uh, in Q3, we continue to advance the district's asset management program and uh, completing some items on the asset management roadmap. Um, Specifically in Q3, we had a few uh, members of staff attend a level of service or a few level of service workshops. Um, as well, we completed in-house the GIS needs assessment uh, for the district. That, uh, that moves us to one of the next steps, which is actually incorporating some of those GIS needs assessments into the 2022 budgets, which you'll see in the coming weeks. Um, and as with the asset management plan, it's, it's sort of an ongoing process. So we continue to review and uh, improve the data quality uh, throughout the year. Any questions on asset management? Good, we'll go through uh, questions at each slide and then that'll keep the thing rolling. Uh, Councillor Barkwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'm a little curious about the GIS um, needs assessment because I, I was under the impression that we were already on a sort of a comprehensive GIS program and uh, had budgeted quite a bit for to update our GIS system already. And that was, yeah. So uh, is that not, was turning out to be insufficient in some way? 
uh, through the mayor. Uh, no, it's not insufficient. It's just one of those ever-changing items. So as we um, come up with more information, such as um, the uh, road study and those sorts of things, we can add those to our GIS software, um, as well as training our staff in, in using it to its mm -hmm. full capacity. It is a very, very powerful tool that uh, we'll continue to use in the coming years. But it is one of those ones that has to be constantly updated as things change throughout the district. Thanks. An example of that probably would be the floodplain mapping that OBWB has completed and the LIDAR data that they send us. So yeah, it's an ongoing process. Okay, uh, any other questions on this first slide? Okay, you're up again for the 10 year capital plan roads and water. Thank you. So this is priority 1.2 and we've also combined priority 1.5 into this as well, which was the road condition assessment, which Mayor and Council are aware that we completed in 2019. Um, so activity to date was the, the road assessment, but uh, the, the plan project for the coming year in 2022, which is grant funded, is, uh, is combining our roads and our water, basically the asset management systems, um, to basically create some criteria to priority, right, prioritize our, uh, our roads and water main improvements. So it'd be a shame to, for example, dig up a road and repave it and find out the following year that uh, one of the water mains needed to be replacement, needed to be replaced at that time. So what this will do is it'll evaluate all of the roads and it's, it's looking at you know, some of the roads that are in poor condition, but it also looks at the volume on those roads. If it's a high volume road that's not in great shape, that'll definitely be a priority to, uh, to take care of. But if it's a lower volume road that's in reasonably good shape, it might be a little longer down the road. Unless, for example, there's a, a water main that desperately needs to be uh, changed out. So this project is, uh, we're looking to issue the RFP in Q1 or Q2 of 2022 and uh, hopefully bring the full 10-year prioritized capital plan to council in Q4 of next year. Uh, I have a question on that. We've already uh, been awarded the grant. Yes. Have we? Okay, yes, thank you. we have. Okay, Councillor Patton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, my only concern is we need to have a roadmap of where we're going. The problem that I, now this is me, is when I drive around the district, we're not seeing anything happening with our roads. And I get that we need the road condition report, but there are those wins that we can get that we're not taking advantage of. And we, we all hear of it. And so my question being is, you have your report coming in in your you know, quarter of 2022, 2023, the final quarter? Is yes. that 20, yes? So what, what is the plan as we move forward to then on, uh, on our roads that uh, where we do have some roads in pretty poor shape and what is the plan? Because we can't wait until then for a road study. We need to know, uh, you know, where are we moving and how are we moving there um, be, uh, just uh, to get some of our roads uh, uh, completed. For sure, yes, through the mayor. Um, we do have uh, some road work identified in the, in the coming budget uh, for 2022. Um, we know that we do have to continually maintain the roads and patching isn't, uh, isn't ideal in a lot of situations. So we do have a, um, smaller ones, but we do have some roads projects planned for the coming year that you'll see in the capital budgets when they come to council in, I guess it's in the new year. Um, I, I don't believe there were too many major road projects done this year, but uh, we will look to definitely advance those moving forward because roads are, are one that uh, we have to stay on top of for sure. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Trainer. Sure, yeah. Um, I agree with what um, Councillor Patton just said. Um, it is a number one thing we hear. Um, we hear about the roads all the time in Summerland and the condition of them. Um, and so I think that once this report is done and maybe even sooner, the more information that we can share with the public, and I said this last time that we talked about this, the better. Like um, if they can see that this plan, once it's available and it's put on our website, then they can see, it's, you know, instead of asking us all the time about a condition of a road, they can go to the website and they can see where that road is ranked and when it's gonna be fixed next. 
Um, and then if we do have any projects coming up, like even if they're little, you know, patchworks or whatever, if those projects could be somehow mentioned in the newsletter. So again, people know what's happening with the roads because we all understand why they take a long time to be done because you need to get the money to get the infrastructure underneath the roads before you pave them. Um, but to the public, they just see potholes. And so the more information that we can share with people, the more transparent we can be, um, and the more we can keep them updated on our projects, again, whether they're big or small in our newsletter, I think that um, they'll, that goes a long way to educating um, the taxpayers. Thanks. And just so you know, Council Trainer, yes, it is on our website, it is shared in our newsletters already, but it, it's, it's beholden to the taxpayer to actually read the material that's presented. Yes, and we do do a good job. The newsletters are very good, but um, I still get questions. And I know, like, you still see people complaining. So just the more we can continue to share, even if it sounds redundant to us, um, if we can even tell one more person that we're going to be paving a certain road, that would help. Yeah, but again, it, they, have to, they have to read it and take in the information themselves. Councillor Holmes. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but... I, I think it's it's really important for us to manage that we do this work that whether we prioritize these things but at the same time I agree that with the asset management work we have done to date we we must know that there's you know a half dozen or whatever roads that are top priority that you know that that so let's just pick one and 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 do this work while we're you know sorting out the priority the detailed priorities uh, I think it's um, kind of frustrating for, for people this year that not to see. Last year was great. We did some really good um, road paving work up to the landfill and, and Victoria North. And um, so, so I think people really appreciate that. Then they, then, then they come and see, well, this year we didn't do anything. So um, I, I think we need to do it continuously. It's because otherwise we just get further and further behind. So. Councillor Patton. Van Alphen will work, but thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> Sorry, I looked straight at you. Councillor Van Alphen. It's all good, thank you. I've been called worse, trust me. <laughs> Not lately. Will this, will this also um, distinguish between, you know, maybe grind and mill and replace versus complete reconstruction? Because I mean, I, I'm just using like Main Street for an example, would be a prime candidate probably for just a grind and relay. I don't know the terminology they use, but, and then you've got other roads in our community like Giant's Head that's going to be a massive project. Um, will this help us with that too? Correct, through the mayor. Um, what it does is it shows the priorities for what type of asphalt replacement needs to be done. So there's mill and fill. Sometimes it's just patching. Sometimes it's the entire road has to be redone, rebuilt right from the subgrade up. Um, so this looks at which roads are going to need that subgrade up, and it'll identify that there's also a water main that's from 1940 in that same road. Let's do them both at the same time um, so that we're only ripping the road up once. But uh, some roads don't need the complete repaving, just running through with uh, a miller and then uh, pace, placing asphalt on top uh, is a suitable solution. Perfect, thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Okay, on to the next slide. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That uh, leads us perfectly into one of the, the major potential road projects for next year. Uh, this is the roadway, water main, and drainage improvements for about 2.6 kilometers along Giants Head Road from Harris to Hillborn. Council's very aware of this project, and uh, they will be receiving a report at the November 22nd meeting um, with uh, some options moving forward. But uh, in short, in Q3, we did review some short-term road improvements, uh, which include just paving of the road. But uh, there will be other options in there that, uh, that show there are some water mains that do need replacement in the area. Um, so we'll bring some borrowing options to Council uh, at that meeting. And uh, if Council did want to move ahead with this project, we are fairly close to being tender ready and could construct in 2022. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it to that report to, uh, to go into the details about that one. Okay, thank you. So as part of our 
budget discussions, we can talk about the borrowing options and how to move forward potentially with that. Yes, we'll actually bring it to uh, an earlier uh, council meeting because there are some important time sensitive uh, decisions that council will potentially have to make prior to the capital budget process. So that's why we're bringing it to the second meeting in November um, for council to, to have a first look at. Thank you. Thanks. Any other questions on this? It's good to see this on the table, isn't it council? Okay. Thank you, Joe. And uh, next up is our Director of the Electrical Utility, sorry, General Manager of the Electrical Utility, Jeremy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So just to <clears throat> refresh everyone's memory on voltage conversion, Summerland has a legacy 8,000 volt uh, power system running through, ta through town. That's all the uh, wires at the top of all the power poles, <clears throat> which we call primary, primary power. Um, so that's a that's an old legacy voltage. Uh, it is causing some problems in Summerland in in regards to um, sort of stifling some of the potential business activity that could go on, making it uh, high cost for power supply uh, for larger customers. So uh, this uh, voltage conversion project was to take that legacy voltage up to twenty five thousand volts, which is industry standard across Canada. <clears throat> Uh, it also gives us some better buying power because uh, all of the other utilities buy infrastructure at 25,000 volts, so it lowers some of our costs in that regard and provides some efficiencies because uh, some of the old transformers we have aren't is as efficient as the new CSA transformers. Um, so in Q3 activity, we did apply for a ICIP grant. That grant was denied for the voltage conversion. So currently, uh, for next steps, we're planning on talking to council about voltage conversion at the budget meetings. Uh, just to refresh your memory, this was part of the energy strategy. Um, so we can discuss uh, whether or not we'd like to see um, Summerland fund this ourselves or apply for any further grants that may come up. Um, but not let the cat out of the bag, but uh, the next um, ICIP grant, we likely won't be recommending this project for because it's uh, written a little bit differently than previous years. And uh, this uh, project likely wouldn't score very high. Um, but currently we are building all of our new construction to 25 kV, 25,000 volts. And so we can replace the system through attrition, which is uh, an option that utilities quite often take to spread out the cost over time. Questions on this one? Councillor Van Elfen. Oh no, sorry. Oh, I see the shadow. <laughs> I see Councillor Holmes' shadow in your, in your glass there. Um, Councillor Holmes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so if we, if we do this through att attrition, you know, it's because we're not being that successful at the grants, how, I guess, how long would it take? It, through the mayor, decades. Okay. Yeah. And and then to follow up, so if we were a bit more purposeful about it and decided we'd do it through phases, um, I, I guess realistically, um, could could you for budget bring forward a, a plan of, of of how we could do it through, you know, over five years or whatever, mm -hmm. and how much it would be per year? Would that be a realistic mm -hmm. thing? to bring forward at budget time. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, through the Mayor, that w that would be the approach, even if we did decide to do this project as sort of one project, it would be a phased approach anyway. Um, you, you can't convert a, a power system sort of in one year. Uh, it would be by feeder anyway. So yes, we already have some estimates for that that we can bring forward at, at budget time. So absolutely, we can bring that we can bring that forward and or sort of have have it in the back pocket uh, for for budget discussions. Um, any budgets that were done prior to COVID will be drastically out of date and need need to be refreshed uh, because the cost of materials has increased considerably. I'll get it right this time, Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Question through to our director. Um, if it was a phased approach, is this an in-house project? Can we do this with ours? 
your staff? Thank you for the question to the mayor. The grant funding, the, the two grants that we applied on for this would not allow that. It would have to be all external. Uh, although we did request in the grant to allow for internal staff, but um, we, we, that would be up to them. The, the, the grant guidelines don't allow for that. <clears throat> so that would be our cost when we grant eligible. Uh, if we were funding it ourselves, it is something we could do in house. Um, we can certainly do it at a lower cost. We don't have the staff to do it currently, but that could be a council decision to staff up for you know a ten year program or five year program or something like that. So it it is a it is an option. Thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? I, I just have one question and it speaks to your statement about the outcome being more resilient energy with increased capacity to withstand extreme weather. Um, I understand the extreme weather part of that, which might be a bit of an angle to getting some, some funding, you know, with the, you know, what's it called, roadmap to 2030. Um, I, I'm wondering, and I, I, this, I'm not sure if you can answer this, but we've talked in the past um, about line loss, like loss of, um, is, is converting to the 25 kilovolt system, is that, uh, does that result in less line loss, which makes us more resilient? The, <clears throat> the reduced line losses don't result in more resiliency it results in a increased efficiency of the system. So the studies we've done on voltage conversion here show a 5% efficiency gain in the power system. And that's from old transformers being replaced that aren't built as efficiently. So they're effectively heating the outside ambient air. Uh, so replacing those with efficient transformers and replacing conductor with larger conductor that has smaller losses. So the conductor we have now is also heating the outside air to some extent. So increasing the voltage, because there's a squared in the formula, uh, gives us a nine times improvement in our line loss efficiency. So you bundle all that together, um, along with some separations for, from phase to phase and some other things like that, and we get a, about 5% efficiency gain. So that's 5% that we're losing right now to just literally heating the outside air and we buy from the wholesale power provider and we sell to the customers and then there's 5% in between that we could get back or we could use as sales. So that's part of the business case for this project. Good, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thanks Jeremy. Back to your counterpart there on Ineos Creek. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this project, Priority 1.6, is completing the repairs from the 2018 high flow in Aeneas Creek. Uh, in Q3, we finalized the design and the tender documents for the six projects which were uh, highlighted as district projects. Um, our next step is to actually go to tender with these projects. We're hoping in Q1 to go to tender. Um, basically, what we're waiting for right now is provincial approvals. The Water Sustainability Act approval is expected. Uh, I actually expect it by now, but hopefully in Q4 we'll get that. As soon as that comes online, um, we'll go to tender very shortly thereafter um, to have this project move ahead. We're also going to be working on the Aeneas Creek flood mitigation plan. Uh, this was a grant we received last year, or this year, sorry, um, to basically map the entire uh, Aeneas Creek to look at the 200 year flows. And uh, the outcome of this is essentially to help us obtain grants in the future um, because we can show what the requirements on that creek are going to be. So this will help our success rate likely in grants to, uh, to top up some of these projects. Councillor Van Elfen and then Councillor Carls. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So if we get an answer in Q4, we go to tender, there's that window of opportunity that we're going to be allowed to work on the creek, correct? Yes. So we're probably another year away before we can set foot in the creek? We're hoping to do some of the works uh, in the general area. What we can do, we will do as soon as possible, but the um, Water Sustainability Act will come back with certain windows that we can't touch. So yeah. uh, we're, we're just waiting. As, as is everyone, um, they were overloaded with uh, 
projects and uh, the approvals are a little bit slower than usual. So okay, thank we're, you. We're hoping. I guess people should have registered their wells on time. Um, I just, I'm pretty sure it was 2017 that we had the biggest, highest waters. And so I just make a note of that 2018 was high as well, but 2017 is the year that we were quite concerned, um, which by 2022 will be five years ago. So I, um, I hope that it doesn't take another 195 years so we get a plan in place. Um, but it just uh, that's a that process is unbelievable. So I hope that it's worthwhile once this is completed. Uh, Councillor Holmes, and then I'll go back to Councillor Van Elfen. Yes, thank you. Um, so the uh, Okanagan Basin Water Board just recently put in this network of hydro uh, metric stations, um, monitoring stations around all around the Okanagan, and, and we have one in Trout Creek now. Um, I'm just wondering if for the, the Enius Creek flood mitigation plan, if having one of those stations in Enius Creek would be useful for, for, for developing that plan or not. Uh, through the mayor, it, it may be. I don't know enough about uh, that project to uh, to know what that the cost is for that. But uh, th those stations are valuable wherever they're put in, um, both to the district here, but also to the the greater uh, basin that we have. So okay. it's something I will look at for sure. Yeah, it might be something worth following up on. Yeah. Thanks. Councillor Van Alphen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. No, just with the you know, when we get the approvals, maybe there'll be different areas that aren't as sensitive, such as like Peach Orchard uh, Trail, for instance, that might, we might be able to get in there before like Garnet Avenue, perhaps because of, you know, fish habitat or what have you. But uh, I'm hoping that, like you say, it's been, it's been a long time here. And Peach Orchard Trail has basically been closed now for five years plus. And uh, it's, it's an absolute crying shame. It's uh, a jewel in our parks and trails. And uh, sooner than later, I hope. Thank you. Okay. Back to the other half of the tag team here. Jeremy, um, Ice and Talk Dam upgrades. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <clears throat> ice and Talk. Um, so this project's to replace the low level outlet pipe intake, um, the outlet uh, structure, um, rip wrap, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> I don't know if council's had a chance to drop in on that project at all uh, through, the, through the fall, but um, an, an amazing project, a, a large project for Summerland. And um, for Q3 activities, uh, we did a war to Dent Construction and so they've been out there and they've been doing a good job. Um, and we've uh, got the access road upgrade uh, completed, although we did do some work on that in, in Q4 uh, four as well. But um, sticking with the Q3 items, um, we did drain the reservoir, coffer dam was installed. We removed the existing pipe, inlet and outlet, um, started on some forming work and started the riprap replacement. Um, we've we've gotten substantially further than that in Q4, but uh, that can wait for a Q4 update. Um, and you can see the next steps there. A number of those are complete as well. Um, I also bring to council's attention that the the driftwood that was uh, left in the reservoir, uh, we will be bringing that to council with some options in December, the December 13th meeting. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate the videos and the pictures that have been taken up there. It's so fascinating to see the scope of that project. Uh, any questions? All right, oh, Councillor Holmes. Just a comment, but I'm sure everybody saw the uh, article about the work here and I think it was on CBC website, yeah, which was I thought was really well done. And uh, so, yeah, it was great that we got that publicity. Okay, next slides for you as well, Jeremy, the Trout Creek Flume. Thank you. Trout Creek Flume. <clears throat> so unfortunately uh, with, with Trout Creek Flume, we've, uh, we were denied the grant again. 
So this is, I believe, the third time that uh, we've we've lost grant funding there. Uh, for next steps, we're going to discuss this, this project again with council at our at our budget meetings and and see what sort of options we have. Uh, we'll throw some on the table for discussion. Um, and uh, the the project is something we need to we need to complete at some point here, and uh, maybe be, be looking at some phased approaches. Um, but we will definitely be keeping an eye out for future grant opportunities still. Any questions on this one, Council? All right, so Joe, Organics Processing Facility. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, for the priority 1.9, Organics Processing, uh, we prepared the site uh, for construction to start on this project. We also uh, finalized the tender and the, the tender will be released in Q1 of 2022. Um, with this project and with all, uh, all the um, communities that received this grant, there was an extension of the deadline until May 30, 30, 31st, 2024. Um, we actually see this as, as an opportunity um, not to delay our project, but to alter our schedule to have our work done in, in a better working window. Um, essentially avoid the expense of winter work and have the work done um, through spring and very early summer of next year. So this will hopefully bring in um, better pricing from the contractors that we're working with. Um, so we'll construct in Q2 and Q3 of 2022 with the grand opening in Q3 of 2022. Um, with the organic curbside collection program, the rollout is gonna be um, in early 2023 and uh, sort of 2023 Q2 through Q4. Um, we did submit for a grant for that project and hope to uh, have some information on that soon. Thank you. Questions on the organic processing facility? Councillor Van Alphen. Thank you. I'm just curious, there's a company in, that I see in town, I think it's called Nature's Gold. They're, I think they're established up at the Brenda Mines site and they're collecting compost materials here in Summerland. Is that going to affect us in any which way, shape or form? Because they seem to be quite aggressive. They've been, I think they're picking up organics from a Soyuz North and uh, taking it up to Brenda's and processing it there. So I don't know if they're just hitting restaurants and larger facilities, but I just find it possible competition. You know, are we going to get enough materials to make this um, work? So just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Yeah, through the mayor. Um, my understanding is we will have enough material just within the district here to keep ours going. Um, there is some sort of a, a processing plant planned for up at the old Brenda Mine site that I'm aware of. Um, I didn't understand, I didn't hear that it had started up yet, but uh, and maybe it has, um, but they're looking for any type of wood waste from around the region. But I, I do think that just being local here in Summerland people, we, we will have the material here to, to make our facility um, a success. Any other questions on this one? Okay, back to Jeremy, watershed management. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This uh, strategic priority is to uh, uh, update our source water assessment and to develop a new source water protection plan or source water, sorry, yeah, source water protection plan. So for the source water assessment, uh, we were successful in a grant, 22,000 for an OBWB in this last Q3. And uh, our competition closed um, a couple weeks ago for uh, having a consultant start on this work. And then for next year and next steps, we have the so source water protection plan that we'll be working on. Good. Questions on this one? Councillor Holmes? Um, 
question or comment, I guess. So, as as I'm sure you're aware, the, again, the Okanagan Basin Water Board's doing a lot of work on uh, source water protection these days, and they have that toolkit, which I think they're coming to present to us about next meeting. Um, that they they they've been in in conjunction. That they've do, been doing these webinars, uh, and uh, there was one from um, the regional district of North Okanagan, the Greater uh, Vernon Water Utility, about the Duto. Duto, if I pronounce that right, Creek Watershed Plan that they've put together, and you, when when you know they have some of the same issues that we have when you when you think of the, all the uses of the our upland water, you know the forestry and the forest service roads and agriculture, recreation, and everything like that all competing and having a potential impact on our watershed, and. Um, I think they have, they've taken a really interesting uh, approach of how you get all these different users uh, and who, who are potentially impacting the watershed together that were through a technical advisory committee that's part of their which is part of their plan and they meet um, and th there's representations from government from First Nations and all these different user groups on it and they meet twice a year to basically reach a consensus on on how we can implement the plan. And I, I, I think that um, there's there's a case study on it, and I th really think it's worth might be worth talking to them to see how they do it, because I see that's gonna be the big challenge for us as well, is how do we get all these um, different diverse groups with different interests working together to the common purpose, thanks. Thanks for those comments, Councillor, and through the Mayor. Uh, we are working with OBWB. We do meet with them regularly. Through, uh, I can't remember if it's monthly now or bi-monthly or what have you, but there is a working group there. And so, yeah, we are plugged into that. Okay, questions? Any further questions? On to, uh, back to Joe for the perpetual slide. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, so for Q3, our priority was actually finalizing the water main tender um, for up along Canyon View. Um, this is another example of a road that will be repaved due to a water main being um, installed. But uh, that project is now with procurement. Um, so it'll be tendered this quarter and construction starting essentially as soon as the snow is gone and they're able to start work in Q1 of 2022. We've also been working with the uh, steering committee, the Trout Creek Steering Committee, which is ONA and PIB. Uh, continue to meet with them, up, I would say every month is uh, what it seems like, maybe every second month. Um, and they're always coming up with some good ideas for us to, uh, for us to look at and that they're also looking at. Um, but our main project for the coming year is definitely getting that water main installed to get rid of any potential leak that we have up there. Uh, following that, we'll definitely move forward on looking at some of the other recommendations in the 2015 report um, that are noted in the slide as well. That should help a bit with the road maintenance as well, right? Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Councillor Holmes. Yeah, could you just, um, could, could, could I just ask, uh, I guess what the steering committee's role is and, and is there other representation on it such as the province? Uh, yes, through the mayor. Um, there are, um, and I don't know who all the, the members are of the group, I've only actually been to one meeting thus far, but uh, there are members of the province that are part of it. There's um, um, a, a few members, just local residents from Summerland that are on the committee. And a lot of it is just that there's so much information out there is bringing all the different individuals together, all with a common goal. And uh, again, I've only been to one meeting, but uh, it feels like a, a fairly proactive group. I think there's federal government res representation too with SRDC right there. There is, yes. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Any further questions on that last slide from Joe? Okay, Brad, lead us home. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, so for Priority 1.12, uh, Deer Ridge Sewer, just um, an update for Council with regards to Q3 activity. We, we did have an engagement session with adjacent landowners 
uh, more uh, familiar uh, and related to the Eco Village concept, but we did talk about sewer extension routes to the Deer Ridge area at that meeting. Um, and as well, uh, Council's aware we are including uh, consideration of the different uh, route, routes to get to Deer Ridge through the Eco Village uh, project um, uh, as part of the design shred process that we're going to be initiating at the end of this year or end of this month, sorry, I should say. Um, so that's happening in Q4 as the next step. Um, we are uh, internally discussing the idea of a potential grant application for extension of sewer um, to the Deer Ridge area, including uh, the Eco Village project. Um, and that would be needed, needing to be submitted by the end of January, 2022. So that'd be another next step. And then as well, um, our, another next step would be to determine if there's any local improvement areas and charges that would be required from the, G, the from the neighborhoods that would be required to pay as part of this p potential sewer expansion project. Questions on this one? I just have one question. Um, and that is, if I'm reading the map correctly, the green portion is, com is the piece that comes up, Taylor Place, I think it's called. I'm wondering if there is the potential at least to have another local service area, uh, what's it called? You know, you know where the new Heron Place Cartwright estates or something like that so it's um north of where it, it shows the little bit on cartwright right now is that a is there a potential there to have another local service area uh, contributing to the project because i don't think they're on sewer are they oh they are on sewer okay never mind that question i thought they had a community okay thank you Anyone else? Councillor Van Elfen. I know it was a while ago, quite a while ago. Um, I think it's west of Deer Ridge. There was a developer at one point in time with potential of X amount of lots. Has have we been, have we had discussions with this person? Because they would be contributing, I'm sure, a fair amount in the future. Yeah, through your, your worship to Councillor Van Elfen. Um, yes, uh, we've had uh, engagement um, with that landowner um, as early as January this past year. Um, we've also had him attend the Eco Village adjacent landowner meeting. He was there in attendance, and uh, um, as you can imagine, is supportive of Council's consideration of the Eco Village project. So. Um, and yeah, there, there seems some willingness, I think, for cost sharing. Okay, if there aren't any further questions on this, uh, we'll go on to the sec sec hmm, second section called Good Governance. And Brad, you're first up on this piece. Thank you, Worship. The first one, uh, priority 2.1 is process improvement, which primarily deals with the development services area, although it does touch all of our areas when it comes to customer service and improving customer service uh, to the general public. Um, for Q3 activity, uh, we've done a lot of uh, bylaw updates. Um, we updated our fees and charges that hadn't been looked at in a number of years in July. Um, we also initiated um, the agritourism accommodation pilot project based on a request from the Chamber of Commerce um in july as well um and uh that that pilot project's proceeding uh we initiated a customer feedback survey at our front counter downstairs at development services um to to engage with our customers to gather their feedback and determine where we're doing what we're doing well and what we're not doing well and determine how we want to make any changes um council also saw some uh, recent driveway access bylaw amendments to also improve our customer service as well as provide clarity in that bylaw um, for both staff interpretation and to the general public. 
And as part of this goal as well, we've initiated the step code and building bylaw review uh, project. Um, and the engagement process for that, we, we started engaging with the general public in September, uh, initiated surveys and surveys are still being collected. So um, I encourage you to get the word out still um, and, and getting community uh, participation in the survey we have on our website. And we're also gonna be hosting a breakfast event on November 19th at the Arts and Cultural Center um, on, with, in partnership with the RDOS on uh, implementation of the step code. Next steps, um, we want to prioritize uh, an RFP being drafted uh, with our procurement department for the new software grant we um, received from UBCM. Um, uh, don't know quite yet on the timing of that, but hopefully the Q4 or Q1 of next year. Um, uh, a couple of additional projects that staff have identified and we'll be bring, bringing forward council reports to council to, for council's consideration. Uh, one being um, is the review of secondary homes on agricultural lands in response to the ALC's policy uh, shift in this that occurred this past July in allowing now secondary homes uh, on our agricultural parcels, as well in including in that, we, we want to review our, our current carriage house regulations that uh, apply to residential zone properties. And so it'd be kind of looking at a housing supply uh, review of our zoning bylaw um, regulations um, and see if we can encourage more small forms of homes on existing properties. And then, uh, uh, further to that, as we mentioned at the last time, we brought administrative updates to our zoning bylaw last fall in 2020. Um, we want to bring forward another update to our zoning bylaw, and, and, and like I mentioned, to kind of review this annually. This will probably be around a Q2 item, I think, of next year, not as high priority as the secondary home review, but um, something that staff want to bring forward to just ensure that we're keeping that zoning bylaw relevant with council. I have to take any questions on this one. Councillor Holland. Uh, thank you. Um, this might come under our alternative energy priority as much as this one, but it's to do with building. So I, I, I heard that if you to install a, an EV charging station in a single detached house, it's like three or four hundred dollars if you do it when you're building the house versus like a thousand over a thousand dollars if you install it later and um, I've heard that some municipalities are looking at requiring EV charging stations be part of any new builds for single detached housing and I'm just wondering if that's ever come up in your world and and uh, with the, either with the committee or, or wherever and uh, um, you know if it's an idea that uh, we might be able to explore Through your worship to Councillor Holmes. Yeah, thank you for the question. And yeah, I am aware that there has been discussion with other local governments about that provision. And it, it is related to uh, my area and the building bylaw. That would be the place where we would require it. Um, and uh, one one item that we are considering as well, and we're, we have a question in our survey out to the public, is not just EV charging, but also solar ready for solar panels on your roof to ensure they have conduit up to your rooftop um built during the building process even if you don't want to put panels in the future so that's another thing as well other local governments have mandated for any new home construction that they require solar ready construction as part of their building bylaw so that is something we could we could um, propose uh, as part of these amendments and definitely looking for some guidance from council on, in this area so um and uh that would help us in a draft bylaw as well to go to the community. Councillor Barkwell. Yeah, um, along the same lines as what Councillor Holmes has brought up, I think it's particularly problematic for any buildings that would be apartment buildings. I mean, an individual homeowner can retrofit his house if he so chooses and decides, but the, for when everybody's going to be required to have cars that are electric, and you live in an apartment, it's going to be a real, real issue. So I think our our very first priority is to um, insist that new uh, apartment type buildings have uh, wiring for electric vehicles. Okay. 
Thank you. Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Through with the conduit for solar, is that not going to be part of the step code? That I don't know what step of the code it is, but it's part of the step code. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Van Helfen, um, the step code more so deals with regulating the energy efficiency of the house itself. Um, so more of the insulation and uh, the, the air proofness of the house to reduce the amount of energy required. It doesn't matter if that energy is coming from natural gas or a solar um, uh, source. Um, the step code is designed around not so much greenhouse gas reductions, but more so energy efficiency. So it, it's higher form uh, insulation, air tightness, that type of thing. So no, that is the answer to the, your question. It does not require um, solar panel insulation as part of its requirements. Anyone else? Okay. On to the next slide. This is over to Graham. Uh, Penticton Indian Band relationship and priorities. I thank you, Madam Mayor. Pleased to speak to this. So council will recall in May, there was a council to council meeting and several actions were tracked from that. So I'm reporting a little bit on those today. Um, in Q3, there was the solar and uh, storage project as well as the Eco Village site tour that occurred with uh, membership from the Council of PIB. That was on July 5th. Um, also coming from that original May Council Council meeting, there was a request of the Chief of PIB for Council to raise with the Minister during UBCM um, the idea of the place names issue and the opportunity for potentially uh, not only signage but programs to fund Indigenous place names and signage, and that did occur on September 13th. Council raised this with the minister. Um, also, in terms of next steps flowing again from those actions, there was a request for the Pierre family road naming, and that would be uh, now added to 300.1 street naming regulations policy for future considerations. So we followed up on that. We're currently working with the PIB council assistants uh, to arrange for the PIB engagement on the proposed recreation centre, Council will recall you uh, set aside a $10,000 budget uh, to appropriately engage PIB throughout the project and so we're endeavouring to do so and in fact the Mayor uh, and Chief met the other day and this was raised also at that time so I think they're quite excited about being involved in that. There was um, also a request of PIB to explore servicing op opportunities in their lands which some of which are near our rodeo grounds. Uh, they're in the process of identifying uh, um, contact on their end to be the one point of contact for them to work with us on those servicing opportunities or at least exploring what's in the realm of the possible in terms of long-term planning and so we're just waiting back to hear from them on that and then planning for the possible joint education and enforcement of the uh, trappers area you'll recall in the springtime and I think it's a regular facet of springtime near Summerland the trappers area becomes inundated with campers um, and there's fires and sometimes illegal dumping and other things as people wait for other areas to open up and then uh, the trappers area becomes very busy and so so too do the lands around the trappers area many of which belong to the PIB and of course there's also private lands there so we are gonna be putting up some proper signage and doing some joint patrols. And we've raised that again with uh, PIB. They do have a guardian program there that we'll work with and obviously with the RCMP and our own bylaw. So that's certainly uh, still on top of mind for us and it's building into our planning for the, for the springtime. Uh, in conversation with my counterpart, CAO Joe Johnson at PIB, we're gonna be planning for another um, another council to council meeting hopefully this calendar year and we'll start to uh, assemble some agenda items there for the uh, council to council conversation so that's where we're at with the PIB update. Questions on this? Okay on to the next slide. Um, our corporate officer will bring us up to date on our bylaw updates. 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. So during Q3, the Good Neighbor Bylaw was adopted at the end of Q2, beginning of Q3. A new consultant has been retained or was retained to begin work on the subdivision and servicing bylaw. The province passed new legislation allowing local governments to conduct council meetings electronically and a review began of the district's council procedure bylaw to implement these changes. The finance department began a review on the permissive tax exemption bylaw for nonprofit organizations and development services began their review of the district district's business license fees. Heading into Q4, uh, the electrical bylaw is currently undergoing an internal review. Again, the subdivision and development servicing bylaw will begin, review will begin with a new consultant with an anticipated draft to be done for spring 2022. The parks bylaw will continue to be worked on and drafted and a review of the traffic bylaw will begin. Questions? Obviously this covers a number of different departments in the district. Okay, thank you, Kendra. Back to Brad, short-term vacation rentals. Thank you, Worship. So just an update here of our uh, active project we have right now for short-term vacation rentals, which is a strategic priority of councils is, we've been pretty busy with this one in Q3. Um, we've initiated public engagement um, in, at the very end of August, following a, uh, a rollout of the campaign and direction from council to proceed. Um, we uh, um, initiated a survey in September and that survey was closed actually October 29th, uh, um, it just closed for, for over a month period and we had a total of 547 respondents to that survey, which is definitely a, a large amount for a community our size uh, on one topic. So definitely people are engaged about this, this topic and the potential um, um, licensing of short-term rentals uh, within the district. We also uh, sent hard copy uh, pamphlets in the mail to all addresses within the district of Summerland, um, 3,600 pamphlets total um, in September, I believe, early September, or sorry, late September. Uh, two newspaper ads and three social media posts on the project as well, um, as well as a couple of times in our newsletter uh, to get the word out uh, on the, our project. Uh, our staff also held a electronic open house on October 26th, um, which was well attended. I think we had just about 40 um, people um, within the community attend that electronic open house over Zoom. And right, uh, we just started now uh, drafting uh, regulations um, based on um, Penticton's approach as a model, but also following some of the feedback we heard from uh, the survey respondents. Um, our next steps is we actually plan to come before council at our next meeting uh, on November 22nd uh, to com to present uh, a summary of the public engagement results and, and a summary of the feedback we heard. Following that, we, we hope to proceed uh, in short order with uh, proposed bylaw amendments, um, hopefully by the end of this uh, by Q4, so maybe still targeting that, that meeting in, in December um, for bylaw amendments for three bylaws being the zoning bylaw, the business licensing bylaw, as well as the fees and charges bylaw. And then going through that ad subsequent adoption process going to probably later January, maybe into early February. I'm happy to take any questions. Councillor Holmes. It's only me today. Um, so yeah, just a question. So, so the, the bylaw amendment that that you'll be bringing forward is that will that still be based on the Penticton model that we uh, approved earlier, or or will um, with the results of the public engagement does that change anything before you bring it forward? Yes. Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Holmes, thank you for the question. Um, yeah. In terms of the feedback that we've received today through the surveys and through the open house as well, it, it sounds like we're uh, the model that we put forward and is is kind of hitting the the right balance between uh, views that we're um, we we've heard. Um, there were some uh, feedback that we received in particular areas of concern, uh, not so much on the model in, in in general, but more so the type of 
form of where we want short-term rentals to occur. Um, uh, there was some discussion uh, from the, the survey respondents that perhaps, and it has led to some amendments that we're proposing as part of the draft regulations um, based on the allowance of where we want short-term rentals, so more so which form of units. Um, more willingness by people to consider them in carriage houses and secondary suites um, as well, even in uh, single family homes, but less so in multifamily housing, if, uh, just to summarize. And so that might be part of our, our zoning recommendations. Um, once we, we do present on this topic, we're open to any additional feedback from council on our, at our next meeting. Thank you. Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but stratas would be policing themselves? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Van Alphen. Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a little bit of both to answer the question directly. We, we, they'll still be required to get licensed under our, our, our system. So, and we would still be responsible to enforce our uh, regulations, whatever we put in place, whether it's the zoning bylaw or, and also the business license regulations. So there, we would be responsible to enforce, but definitely stratas, um, because of their nature of having independence and governance through their own systems, have an ability to govern and enforce as well. Um, so I, I think it'd be a little bit of both. And they also have the, the ability to find their own members. Uh, just one question I have. Will the business license, that will be in another amendment to the one that we spoke about earlier today, the fees and charges bylaw? Yeah, thanks, Your Worship, for the question. Yeah, yes, you're correct. So we, although we just passed the new Schedule F, or not not passed yet, but a third reading, um, we would propose an amendment to that schedule for to uh, including a separate uh, fee for short-term rentals in the future. Great, thank you. Councillor Barkwell. Yes, no, thank you, Madam Mayor. I was not clear on the on the timing of some of these uh, you're proposing on this um, business licenses and fees and schedules and stuff. Wouldn't there be certain things that we'd want to make sure we get passed in December so they could take effect January first, twenty twenty two? Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Barkwell, that would be ideal. Um, we're, we're probably not going to be able to have it ready for January first. Um, uh, which, uh, uh, just because of the nature of going through a public hearing process, which would be required for, for the zoning bylaw. Mm -hmm. Um, so a uh, best case scenario, I'd say around February, which is not, not worse, not, not worst case scenario because, um, you know, the primarily our, our, our season here for short term rentals is starting around March, April. So ideally we'd like to get, um, whatever is developed in place by uh, that early February range so that we can bring those existing licenses, licensed operations into conformance before the season starts, before tourism. So, so when did you say that the business license will be adopted? Uh, the recommendation was 125 and uh, that would be for January 1st, right? Sorry, that was for, that was for the current Schedule F that we we're yeah. proposing today. Yeah. Um, we are proposing to bring that back at our next meeting for adoption. That'll be adoption next meeting. That's okay. right. But then it may be a further amendment for short term rentals yeah. Yeah. Uh, at a later point in time. But that's just one item. Yeah. Yeah, that's just one item. Yeah. Okay. Councillor Holmes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I attended the open house and it was pretty interesting. Uh, I. Um, uh, one thing that came up there was what Councillor Barkle was mentioning about uh, previous bookings and somebody was saying that, you know, they get bookings a year or so in advance and they're, and somebody was w wondering whether we could have a kind of a grace period recognizing that thing because it caused quite a bit of inconvenience for people who have already taken bookings on and then if the rules change on them, um, you know, not, you know, before the season starts, I'm just wondering is that something that uh, we'd be able to consider? like kind of grandfather it in somehow. It's um, definitely something we could talk with council as we move forward as part of this process. Um, I think it'd be 
prudent to, to hear from the public through the public hearing process as well, to hear those concerns directly from operators. Um, we, at the staff side of things, we, we are um, preparing for um, the impact for short-term rentals for next year, uh, 2022. So that means the budgetary impacts we're expecting uh, council will um, put something in place. I'm not too sure what that may be, and and council can tell us uh, if that's a wrong assumption. But um, and uh, so therefore we are planning in terms of our budgetary process, um, potential revenue as well as cost impacts to our our, our staff resources and and getting this uh, licensing regime up front. So if there's a waiver period, that may influence those projections, um, but. Maybe something that council could decide at a later point. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Brad. David, you are up, Director of Finance. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, so quarter three was a, was an active quarter in regards to the tax base agricultural land assessment priority. We received a letter from Agricultural Resources Division uh, noting that there are currently no existing funding programs that could help the district. Council did meet with Minister Popham as part of this year's UBCM meetings to discuss the district's concerns. Um, and as part of that meeting, we, we changed our approach from strictly looking at the costs to service the ALR lands to also looking at the overall developable lands within the entire district. So to summarize that, the, the district is in a position where 50% of our land base is classified as undevelopable. So when we speak of undevelopable, it's anything from a slope grade over 30%, water course, uh, watersheds, those types of things. So half of the remaining developable lands are actually in the province's uh, agricultural land reserve. So in theory or in essence, we can only develop 25% of our overall land base without any external encumbrances, which uh, definitely limits our growth potential. So we did bring that forward uh, to the minister and uh, we did follow up with a letter to Minister Popham summarizing the meeting and uh, our requests, uh, we are awaiting a response back from them. Looking forward, we will continue to advocate with the province as well as our other organizations such as SILGA uh, to see if we can get some more, more traction on this, on this area. With that, uh, that summarizes up. Questions, Council? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, with the review of secondary dwellings being allowed on ALR land with the ALR's new rules and policies coming into effect in 2022 will help make some type of difference taxation wise. Because they would be taxed as a non agricultural use through the mayor uh yes depending on what direction council was to go in uh, on that regard if there was a decision made where uh, those secondary dwellings were permitted then bc assessment would classify though i'm assuming bc assessment would classify those as class one residential homes which would be taxed at a uh, larger assessed value than would a uh, agricultural property Anyone else? Councillor Holmes. Um, I, I, I guess what I, I think would help our case is if there are other um, municipalities out there kind of in the same boat, you know, they, who, who have limited growth potential due to whatever reason, topography or, or agriculture. Uh, and I, I think we really need to find those other municipalities and work with them um, because I don't I think going it alone isn't really going to get us too far. I 
think that perhaps um, Dave's uh, note that looking at uh, possible advocation through SILGA and UBCM is a good way to connect with other municipalities. Certainly, um, you know, as vice president, I'm I'm open to that. Councillor Carlson. Thank you. Um, I know it's a complicated topic. I, I think it's actually interesting to consider that we're limited in how much of the land we can develop in this community. Uh, we always have been, and I think that the community continues to grow and there's huge potential still. We have, if you, you we're gonna do a, we're doing a downtown plan and it's gonna show us just how much redevelopment and population growth we could anticipate in the coming five, 10, 50 years. And I, I think it's, um, this is this is important, but at the same time, you know, we've got rural roads that go through rural areas and agriculture. And unfortunately, I don't think we're always gonna be able to keep them as smooth as a fully serviced city road. And I don't think that we should have that goal in our mind. And so there's there's a give and a take. And I believe that um, it's gonna be interesting to see what we get from this downtown plan and how much, how much growth uh, potential we have without having to further this conversation too much further. Okay. Don't see any other hands raised. Thank you, Dave. On to the next section, community resiliency. Um, back to Brad for affordable and supportive housing. Thank you, Worship. Um, just a quick update on this one. Um, strategic uh, priority 3.1, affordable supportive housing opportunities. Um, for Q3 activity, uh, we've been just trying to help and facilitate uh, partnerships locally, primarily. Um, uh, we've had some meetings, just myself personally, um, on with the district, that's someone representing the district, uh, with United Church and the Food Bank property uh, across uh, from Municipal Hall here. And there's a potential opportunity for a renewed partnership between those two organizations. So that's a positive step. Um, for a potential uh, affordable housing project um, uh, at that location. Um, next steps, we just continue to support efforts by community organization to bring forward unique affordable housing projects um, as well. We're willing to work with BC Housing on any additional information required for, for additional grant applications in the future, um, but happy to take any questions on this one. Councillor Holmes. Um, I think what the community would like to know, and certainly I'd like to know, is what the heck happened to the former RCMP site. I don't know how much you can say on that, but uh, there's a lot. People are asking a lot of questions about why that's not going ahead as planned. Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Holmes. Yeah, I, I don't know how much I can say either. Um, we we do know that the the arrangement that was uh, in place for that, uh, specifically that land location on Jubilee Road across from the arena um, has fallen through um, from the current owner of the land uh, with BC Housing. So I'm not too sure what that leaves the other parties. Uh, I, um, I am hopeful that they're able to find another location within the community and we're gonna be able to help them do that if they are inquiring. Okay. Nope. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brad. Back to Graham for Chamber of Commerce and Industry Engagement. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, just an update. I lost my place here. Oh, there we are. Okay. So just an update on that. Obviously, a number of things happening in terms of continued engagement. I haven't listed them all here, but uh, one of the things that comes to mind is the um, sort of COVID-friendly light up for Christmas that uh, we're currently planning towards and a lot of planning activity associated with that, some good ideas flowing back and forth. There's, there is uh, a need to um, engage further on the future location uh, or the future uh, resolution of their visitor center and their, our land lease there. There's discussions occurring 
in that regard. And in the evening package tonight, council will see a couple of letters from the chamber that we will be uh, responding to, obviously, you know, offering a meeting to talk about the topics that they've raised in that regard. And we are excited to be working with Kristen, who's the new business recovery advisor on staff for the chamber. And they have uh, been doing a lot of um, uh, conversations with various uh, business owners throughout the community and uh, conducting a survey and they'll be sharing uh, the results with us on the on the survey that they've done with business owners and of course not only what the chamber might focus in but I'm sure some some lessons and some ideas and some themes in terms of how we can work together with the chamber on making sure we have the right investment climate here in uh, Summerland so that's the update on the chamber. Thank you. Any questions on that? All right. Um, Lori is up next, the cultural plan implementation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So as far as the cultural plan implementation, uh, the 2021 banner program, which is led by the Summerland Community Arts Council, has been implemented and they hosted the reception on July 15th. Uh, the cultural plan includes a recommendation to name a street or a public space after George Riga. At the August 23rd council meeting, council named the Arts and Cultural Centre on 9525 Wharton Street as the George Riga Arts and Cultural Centre. On September 14th, district staff met with School District 67 and representation from the Summerland Community Arts Council to discuss the optimization and operational opportunities for the Centre Stage Theatre. So we are continuing to advocate to have the theatre open for community use as soon as possible. Uh, the management group is looking into updating the 1987 joint use agreement, reviewing other community theatre joint use agreements best practices, developing strategies to promote the theatre and events, conducting an inventory of theatre assets, and looking to replace the theatre technician who has moved away from the community. One of the biggest challenges with this theater is the classroom is uh, the school drama classroom, or the, sorry, the, there is a classroom um, which is located inside the theater and it's for the, the school drama program and it limits the opportunities for daytime access uh, and storage for groups that are coming into town and, and looking to do a show, uh, which is not the case in other community or joint use theaters. Uh, also in September, we were notified that our Healthy Community Grant uh, application for enhancing arts and cultural centers outdoor spaces was not successful. These funds were proposed for creating informal and formal gathering spaces for outdoor programs and events uh, and implementing a ramp to improve accessibility to, main, to the main floor. Uh, staff will include a capital project budget for the accessible ramp uh, for Council's consideration in the 2022 budget deliberations. As far as next steps, uh, we are assisting the Arts Council on setting up administration protocols for rentals uh, on the second floor for community use. And we are working with the museum on a procurement process for design drawings for the museum expansion project. Questions for Lori? Thanks, Bray. Brad, South Okanagan Agricultural Food Hub. Thank you, Worship. Um, another item that we've been pretty active with uh, in Q3 uh, is the Okanagan Food and Innovation Hub. Um, we were successful, if Council remembers, um, in getting additional grant funding from the Economic Trust of Southern Interior um, uh, for $37,000, just over $37,000 for additional feasibility activities, which we've now initiated. Um, we also had a, uh, a meeting with uh, provincial ministers uh, for the UBCM virtual meetings with both uh, Minister Popham and Minister Calon, uh, I believe, um, from the two ministries that are potentially going to be involved with this project, um, so which I thought was was quite positive. So, um, 
following that in September, we, we uh, issued an RFP and awarded a project to uh, Green Chain Consulting as our consultant to help us with the feasibility activities to get us ready for potential grant funding to higher levels uh, uh, of government, being provincial and federal funding. Um, they've established a great team Green Chain has uh, on our behalf um, that uh, pulls uh, from different areas of expertise, um, such as business planning, architecture, as, and the team that they've established have been successful in establishing food hubs in a lot of other regions of British Columbia um, on the island and throughout uh, the lower mainland as well as the interior. So uh, we, we feel that we've got a really great consulting team helping us stick out of this project moving forward. Um, with that team, we've recently uh, released uh, an expression of interest process for a land and building partner just last week um, um, within the district of Summerland. Um, we're, we're putting the call out to uh, interested landowners as well as people that have existing buildings that might suit the hub um, to put a proposal in to the district of Summerland, which ends on November 25th. Um, and uh, that's kind of a Q4 item, and we're hoping that we can narrow down uh, a list of a few options for council to present to council for a selection of a preferred partner for land and building by uh, our, our meeting in December uh, 13th. And then uh, following that, in terms of other feasibility activities, we want to revise the business plan to potentially scale down the costs of the first phase of the a food hub um, a, a, along with our our building our, our land partner uh, to ensure that it fits that location um, and once that business plan is revised then be ready for potential grant applications uh, that we are expecting to be opened up next spring um, we are um, hoping to uh, move forward with this project next summer and we've set a timeline to do that um, and and happy to announce too that just uh, uh, last week we presented to the RDOS uh, for a regional grant and aid and we were successful in receiving $15,000 from the RDOS towards this project for next year as well. So happy to take any questions on this one. Questions? Just a reminder for council that um, ministry staff is continuing to work with our staff on making sure that we are able to put forward the best grant application for the highest chance of success in this next intake. Councillor Barkwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Do I remember correctly that the ministry staff said there's like nine of these food hubs already throughout the province? Yeah, I'm not too sure of the number, but it's up there. Um, yeah. yeah, it could be double digits, actually. So it sounds like they're successful, and that this would be a logical place to have another one. Let's, let's hope we've been working on this for a long time. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Thanks for that update, Brad. Uh, Graham, community conversation on racism. Thank you, Your Worship. So, as indicated here, a couple meetings have occurred with the South Okanagan Immigrant Community Services Collaborative during the reporting period, and as indicated, next steps will keep meeting with them. But in terms of a couple of highlights, one is the new Unbox initiative uh, that was launched, and so this is a free exploration toolkit that with cultural diversity appreciation tools, initiatives, and resources within the communities of Summerland, Soyuz, and Penticton, and you'll see posters all along the library windows over here about that unboxed initiative. Um, also, there's a, a program, well, sort of an initiative that they have going there with the One World Youth Crew, and it's called Project Vandal. It's about an online reporting system for vandalism in, in a number of communities, and uh, they get the information and then they need to determine what's the right pathway to pass that along for action for cleanup of vandalism within a community. So we did uh, set up a meeting there and had conversations with appropriate staff from our public works department. We are in for interested in the information they have and we're setting up those pathways to keep the information channels open when vandalism does occur, we can respond to it quickly. That's the update on conversation on racism. 
Thank you, Graham. Questions, Council? All right. Uh, Brad, Eco Village Development. Thanks, Your Worship. Um, this is a new priority action item that was added uh, since Q2 um, to our list, uh, priority 3.6, the Eco Village Development. Uh, was added to our strategic priorities in August. Um, uh, in Q3, uh, we released a invitational RFP for qualified consultants to uh, help us prepare a, a detailed design concept for the Eco Village project. Um, this uh, RFP was awarded to Modus Planning and Design. Um, as part of their uh, work scope, um, our, our detailed archaeological uh, environmental and geotechnical assessments um, uh, that are were initiated in, in early October. Um, I do want to mention as well that the partnership, the part of our team that's working th through our consultant is the PIB Natural Resources Department on the archaeological side. So it's a positive side that we're collaborating with PIB with regards to the archaeological component. Um, we, we had a site tour with our overall consulting team on October 27th uh, and walked the site with them. Um, and we are just in the final stages of uh, preparing a project webpage that'll be released this week to collect feedback from the community on um, the, the land area where the Eco Village project will be sited. And we, it's a GIS based uh, um, crowdsourcing platform that we're going to ask people to upload pictures and areas of interest and v views that they appreciate uh, about the site um, to help us as we move into the design charrette process um, that is the next step of this uh, work item. Um, and so uh, other next steps, I mentioned already the design charrette, it's happening November 29th and 30th. Um, then following from that, we wanna finalize um, the, the design and present a uh, draft design, probably you're looking at Q1 in 2022, um, and then uh, proceed with any um, bylaw uh, amendments we might require for, for the zoning side, uh, restricted covenants um, as well, that we are uh, requiring of our consultant to provide us architectural guidelines, and they do have an architect on, on their team. Um, uh, to in their provision of deliverables to, to ensure that we're gonna re require that whoever does develop this property um, does so uh, following our prescribed uh, uh, design criteria. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Councillor Holmes. Um, sorry, I might've missed it, but so who, who will be participating in the design cons uh, concept? Will be community stakeholders? Yeah, good question. Through the, your worship to Councillor Holmes, um, due to co restrictions on numbers, um, similar to like what we did with the downtown plan, we are uh, doing an invitation only uh, event of key stakeholders that we're identifying that need to be part of the design concept um, process. Um, uh, some of the stakeholders we've already engaged with being the recreational trail user groups would be one. Um, Penticton Indian Band, we're gonna reach out to them directly as well as adjacent landowners um, being others um, that we'd like to have them in the room. Um, some key staff uh, um, from our side um, and, uh, uh, and yeah, but other than that, I'm, 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 any other recommendations from council uh, for who should be there, we're open to hearing from, from you on that. Thank you. Graham? Just checking with Brad here also, the college, I believe, uh, right, did you wanna talk about that too? Because it goes back to the Penticton Indian Bad recommendation. Yeah, thanks Graham, thanks for reminding me of that. So yeah, another recommendation from uh, Penticton Indian Band Council, um, when we were doing the site tour with uh, council um, to council, of the site um, was to reach out to Okanagan College. Um, I think it's called the Sustainable Construction Institute, um, or I can't remember the exact name, but um, uh, locally here, and there might be some opportunity for them to be involved or get some youth uh, that are part of that program um, to participate in this event as well um, and lend their expertise. Um, so that would yeah, be an, another invite that we'd be hoping to invite to this. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, thank you. I just have one question. Um, when when do you, are you expecting that the assessments will be completed? The preliminary estimate our assessments are supposed to be completed before the design charrette workshop. So I would actually think within the next couple of weeks. Um, the idea being is that we want to have that baseline knowledge before we start designing. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Um, on to 25, solar and storage projects. So the first part of section four, that's for Jeremy. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So uh, <clears throat> for the solar and storage project, Q3 was sort of the summit of a lot of work uh, to do with the writing of the RFP and the specification. Uh, so the RFP was issued in Q3. We started bid evaluations <clears throat> by the end of Q3. Uh, we had received some presentations from bidders, et cetera. So um, we were working away on that. Um, and we also had an environmental permit issued from development services. So for next steps, <clears throat> um, we'll be um, coming to council with bid results. And I believe that's on the 22nd of this month at the next council meeting and uh, talking about next steps there and uh, be getting into hopefully an award and detailed design. Okay, questions on this one? Thank you. Joe, Climate Action Plan Implementation. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, in Q3, we uh, initiated the BC Energy step code implementation process. Uh, that was in late August. Uh, that was in addition to the building bylaw review. Um, there was some reporting done on the electrical vehicle charging stations uh, early on in the quarter. And uh, good news, we've hired a new sustainability and alternate energy coordinator, uh, Odessa Cohen, starts uh, next Monday, I believe. And uh, that'll be part of the next steps are getting her up to speed with our uh, community energy and emissions reduction plan and the corporate energy and emissions management plan um, five year implementation. And uh, as well, completing a unit by unit assessment to determine the five year capital plan to green our, ex our fleet that we have within the district. Questions, Council? Okay, Jeremy, community energy strategy. Thank you again, Madam Mayor. Had a mic left on there. <clears throat> so the energy strategy, uh, we brought the report to council in Q3 and had some discussion at, at a council meeting. Um, and uh, out of that meeting, there was some discussion around uh, uh, communicating the peak shaving concept to the community. So we, we put that in a newsletter um, I can't show any numbers on whether or not that actually uh, was helpful or not or, or actually shaved or how much peak it would have shaved, but uh, we do have a lot of people in Summerline, Summerline that do read the newsletter, so um, hopefully it got out there to reduce your energy usage during those peak times, which is sort of dinner time and early morning. Um, and uh, as per Council's direction at that meeting, we are still working on the modern metering report. Um, and uh, that's currently in draft. Council Barkwell. By modern metering, metering, easy for you to say, um, you mean time of day charges, like uh, variable charges for time of day? Yep, through the mayor, yeah. that's correct. That's part of that uh, report. Yeah, that'll be interesting. That's done so many other places and Anyone else? Okay, on to the next section, section five, active lifestyles. Lori, oh, Lori gets this whole section, of course she does. <laughs> Community Recreation and Health Center. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, the consulting teams uh, have been working uh, on providing council updates throughout uh, this entire term for the feasibility studies uh, through Committee of the Whole meetings. And they have been engaging uh, with the Steering Committee and the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee for input. 
Uh, the rec center consultants have completed stakeholder engagement and have been narrowing down uh, site fit options on the Kelly Avenue and Jubilee Road sites. Engagement included uh, the IOOF Hall, Timber Mart, Youth Centre, Little Chicks Daycare and the school district. Uh, the health centre consultants uh, have been searching and assessing site locations for the downtown core and have expanded slightly out uh, to try to find a suitable site and have completed their functional program. Next steps in these projects, uh, the rec centre consultants are completing costing analysis for two shortlisted options. They will be implementing public engagement from November 15th to the 29th, and this includes display boards at the lobby of the Aquatic Center, Arena and District Hall. Uh, a hard copy and online survey will be available uh, through that time period. An in-person open house is scheduled for November 16th with project presentations, and that'll be held at the uh, Arena um, Banquet Room. And there's two sessions at 4.30 and 6.30 p.m. Uh, they will be back to Council on December 13th to present the results of the engagement and they're aiming to provide a draft final report by December 17th which will include uh, recommendations and a business case and they're aiming to present the final report to Council in January. The Health Centre consultants uh, are targeting to provide uh, analysis of the five shortlisted properties to Council on November 22nd. That will be followed by uh, development of concepts of those uh, two shortlisted options uh, through to the end of January. Uh, they would present those options to the public in February and they are now targeting the completion of their final report and business case uh, in March or April. So different from what our slide shows, correct? Uh, yes, that's okay. been updated just oh. this week. <laughs> um, uh, updated to me, sorry, not the oh, slide. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry, thank you. That's good to know. Questions, Council? All right, so on to your next one, Parks and Recreation Master Plan. Q3 activity included the uh, installation of outdoor fitness equipment and, uh, in Memorial Park in late June, uh, completion of the Peach Orchard pickleball courts in August, installation of the temporary fenced off-leash dog park at Dale Meadows Sports Complex. Uh, while we tried to purchase fencing uh, for this project uh, due to supply chain issues, uh, fencing is not currently available. Uh, so we are doing month to month rentals and we'll continue to search for uh, supply to be able to purchase uh, the, the Modulock fencing. Uh, we've hired a gate contractor to open the gate from dawn to dusk uh, at Dale Meadows to allow for access for people with mobility issues to have close access to the entrance. We are collecting feedback from users and we'll report back to Council in January with an update during the Q4 report. And I'd just like to note that we haven't put any restrictions on the size or the weight of dogs in this park. Uh, we are keeping it open for all dogs. And dog owners are monitoring their comfort level based on what dogs are at the park when they arrive. Um, we've had a few questions on whether or not we were, would be putting up signage for small dogs only. At this point, we are suggesting that uh, we keep it open for everyone and assess in January. As far as next steps, um, we are discussing the 145 master plan recommendations uh, to the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee and looking for 2022 projects to bring forward for council consideration during the budget process. We are currently uh, completing tennis court design layout and costing for the Lakeshore Racquet Centre. And uh, we're also looking at uh, the cost for consideration um, for comparison, uh, looking at the Powell Beach tennis court replacement as well to look at what those different costs might be. And that will be coming forward to council as part of the 2022 budget process. 
And we are initiating the waterfront concept plan. The RFP has been issued and a consulting team has been hired. As noted at the last report, Horse Beach is now included in the scope of work for the waterfront concept plan. Uh, the project will take place uh, starting next week and through to April. And just a reminder that we do have a $10,000 grant to assist uh, with funding for this project. Councillor Holmes? Uh, you have questions on a couple of the items here, if I may. Uh, first, the off-leash dog park. Is there, um, so so it's a temporary um, facility right now. We're, we're going to monitor to see the, see how it works. And then be, you know, then we make a decision to make it a permanent one or not. Is that the idea? Thank you through Madam Mayor to Councillor Holmes. Yeah, it, um, the direction from council was to do it as a pilot project to start and to reassess after a full year. So uh, we'll provide updates throughout the year so you can see um, what sort of feedback we're getting. Uh, but the intention was a pilot project uh, temporary till September of next year and then to come back and decide what we might want to do for the future. And just to follow up, is so what's the mechanism for, for people to provide feedback? Uh, through Madam Mayor to Councillor Holmes, uh, we have posted a, uh, an email address at, at the park and we're encouraging people to write their feedback uh, to us and we're collecting that uh, through that forum. Okay, thanks. And another question, if I may, on another item. Okay, anybody else have questions on this? Go ahead, Councillor Holmes. Um, just for the, the waterfront concept plan. Um, so is is the scope of that plan set in stone if we wanted to, um, depending on the results of our discussion tonight and s subsequent uh, uh, public hearing and everything like that, if we wanted to extend the boundaries to include the, the, ra the racket center land, would that be a possibility? Uh, through Madam Mayor to Councillor Holmes, uh, the scope is set based on the budget right now. Uh, if we were to uh, change the scope, then it may impact the budget and remire, you know, need a, an amendment to the existing contract. So, so right now it's it's Rotary Beach to Peach Orchard, um, the, the Correct. box basically. Uh, with the addition of Horse Beach added into the scope of work. Sorry. Horse speech is also Horse speech. All right. yeah. included. All right. Um, arena assessment. Q3 work completed to date includes researching other communities' arena condition assessments and development of the scope of work for the project. The RFP was issued on November 2nd, and it's expected to be implemented over the next four to six months. And uh, just a reminder that we do have a grant of $10,000 to provide funding support for this project as well. Okay, I guess no questions on that one. So uh, Memorial Park Playground. Uh, the scope of work uh, completed for quarter three was uh, an RFP was drafted with a design build format. Uh, the RFP was issued on October 27th and it closes on November 16th. Uh, there was an optional site meeting for playground companies on November 3rd, which I'm happy to say there were several companies out um, looking at the project and asking questions. Uh, we're targeting to have the contract awarded by November 29th and starting uh, the community engagement piece uh, with council and the service clubs immediately. Um, we do understand there are challenges with ordering equipment and getting it in and getting it installed. Uh, so we're trying to move this as quickly as possible. Uh, so we'll be coming uh, back to council once we have a preferred uh, proponent uh, confirmed. Um, by December 13th or maybe on December 13th for your input into the design piece before the equipment is ordered. And we'll also be engaging the service clubs that are part of this project and contributing funds. 
And so as soon as that piece is done, uh, we hope to get everything ordered before the end of the year so that we can uh, look at a proposed installation data by June 24th of 2022. Just in time for school to get out. <laughs> it's great. Councillor Trainer. Can you remind me of the total budget for that project again? We have $250,000. Approved. We may have uh, some additional funds through the service clubs on top of that, uh, but that's all inclusive. So that's the equipment, that's removal of existing, that's the borders, the surfacing. Um, so everything is all inclusive in that. Okay, and then, sorry, you said that we don't have final numbers for donations though from- We don't, no. Okay. Uh, we do have uh, $10,000 committed through uh, the Kinsman Club. Uh, we do also have uh, kind of agreement in principle through the credit union. We'll be contributing some funds, but the final number hasn't been issued yet. The Rotary Club is also interested in participating, but they weren't able to give us numbers yet. Um, and um, the Fire Department Association is also wanting to help contribute as well. Okay, great, thank you. Other questions? Did you have a comment? Yes, Graham. And uh, unless unless I missed it, also some uh, offers of volunteer labor, correct, from same organizations. So, which we'll figure out how to properly coordinate. Good. That's a great community project. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on this? Okay, now on to our final strategic priority, act, uh, sorry, downtown vibrancy. And these are all three for Brad. Beginning with downtown neighborhood plan. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, so with regards to our downtown neighborhood action plan uh, for Q3 activity, we've awarded uh, the project to Urban Systems uh, in August of 2021, and they've uh, hit the ground running with um, completing some activities on our behalf uh, for the creation of a new downtown neighborhood action plan. They, um, they started with starting with a background document review of all of our uh, relevant planning documents that are pertaining to the downtown area um, that we hosted with the downtown neighborhood uh, task force. Um, in September, a, a new vis a visiting session um, with our consultants leading us uh, um, asking questions about what we want our downtown to be, moving to the future, what we consider our downtown right now. Um, we created a staff steering committee um, to meet with our consultant on a reoccurring basis throughout the project as part of their proposal um, to, to, to touch base to ensure that what we are developing is going to be in conformance with our asset manager plan, our, our tenure capital plans uh, that are already developed. Um, uh, and so that committee meeting has been, or sorry, that committee has been meeting as well. Um, we also held a uh, design shred workshop uh, as well as a downtown walking tour event on October 13th. And uh, I think it was a pretty successful day. We've got a lot of good feedback um, from that day. And right now our consultants are, are using that feedback to develop some concepts uh, for our uh, attention uh, for specifically with Memorial Park. And that's some of the next type items, right? Uh, moving onto the slide here, um, we've got actually an engineering review of the downtown infrastructure right now as an immediate next step, um, a meeting pretty soon to talk about that. Um, our consultant right now is completing a land use inventory and, and policy recommendations. So that's actually coming from Councillor Councillor Carlson's comments about growth, where we want growth to occur within the downtown core and to what form of growth. That's some of the questions that we pose to our consultant. Um, uh, and to be providing us some recommendations back for for plan amendments. Um, and uh, next steps as well, it includes those Memorial Park concepts to be presented to the, the, next, the next meeting of the task force in, in late November. Um, and we're also looking at potential uh, council presentation on those concepts as well in, in Q4. And then finally, uh, once council has seen them, uh, proceed to public engagement of those concepts. Um, and I'm happy to take any uh, questions. Councillor Holmes. 
Um, not a question, just a comment on the Memorial Park uh, charrette and the downtown walking tour we had. They were, they, that was an amazing day. And I, I really appreciate um, the staff that came out to support that. It, on, on the walking tour, you know, you, you know the, the work staff that you had, Martin, explaining to the task force members all the kind of the pressure points for traffic you know he knew exactly you had jeremy identi identifying every single tree along main street and telling you know explaining the health of that tree and this one's about to die this one's perfectly fine and and explaining to every, that's why so you know that kind of detail was just incredible so really appreciate it, it was a great day okay um Next uh, item is the George Riga Arts and Culture Centre renovation. Yeah, thank you, Worship. So um, we were quite busy in Q3 with this one as well, um, finalizing the project um, uh, over the last quarter. Um, we received temporary occupancy for the building in August 2021, uh, following the substantial renovation we completed to the building. Um, following that temporary occupancy being given, the Arts Council was uh, permitted to move in uh, and started doing so in early September. Um, staff made the call to make a, a couple of additional changes to the uh, scope to uh, replace the exterior gutters because um, to, to, it was a safety hazard uh, with the current state of the, the gutters that was done in September. Um, and then we also initiated the new signage um, I think it was early October when we in initiated those the new signs for, for George Riga. Um, next steps for the project is pretty much done. Uh, there are a couple of small architectural deficiencies um, that have been uh, provided by um, Cal Mickeljohn, and so we're just um, finalizing those before we get final sign off from um, our building department on final occupancy. So, uh, but uh, uh, the project is pretty much done, so we're, we've been a successful in terms of landing this one. Great. I don't see any questions on that one. So the Main Street Outdoor Patio Design Guidelines, please. Thanks, this is the last one. Uh, and thanks for your patience. Um, this is just a minor inclusion, I would say, to uh, our our overall downtown neighborhood action plan. It is it is a strategic priority of councils, but it's been kind of uh, tagged on to the downtown plan uh, as a deliverable of our consultant um, to um, uh, potentially uh, provide us some design guidelines for outdoor patios. Um, if council members uh, last spring, we did approve uh, the rapid approval uh, process for um, uh, temporary sidewalk patios uh, in response to the COVID restrictions in April of last spring. Um, uh, those have been, been since removed for the winter season. Um, we probably can expect some requests for those to come back in the in the spring. Um, so um, we most likely won't have those guidelines done by, by that point, but we'll have to make a decision on, on which other, what we're going to allow for next spring, probably at a later point. I have a question about the name of this priority. Is it just for the main street or is it for the streets, you know, off of the main street in the downtown core for the patios? Yeah, yeah thanks, Your Worship. I think primarily it's it's all of the downtown core. It's not just main street. Um, um, I believe the impetus for the project came from True Grain in, uh, in their original um, request. So that was on main street, but um, um, you know, definitely we're from other communities and what we've seen, especially with COVID, there's a real growth in this type of demand for use of the road right away um, for patios and for, for not just patios, but also like sidewalk sales and other business usages, usages of the, the sidewalk and, and parking lots. So, and it's something I think uh, we want to encourage um, safely. Um, so uh, definitely the side streets like Henry and Kelly and Victoria um, should be supported as well. Thank you. Any questions on this council? All right. Um, so we're doing pretty good for time. Thank you, Brad, and everyone else that's already uh, presented. 
I'll just say on behalf of Council, we really appreciate having these quarterly updates. It's really a great thing to be having. Um, last but not least is our new fire chief, uh, Chief Robinson. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Councillors. Nothing. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Councillors. Nothing like being thrown into the fire on my first day. <laughs> uh, to give you a quarterly three update from the fire department, um, we'll start off with the incidents. Um, you can see July, oh, is it on a total there? Oh yes, it is, sorry, okay. Um, July, 41 incidents, August, 31 incidents, and September, 30 incidents. We are currently, to date, 63 incidents over from last year, which adds up to about 31% uh, um, call volume increase. And that's basically it for incidents. Next slide, we have training. Um, unfortunately, um, training numbers are being impacted by COVID. Uh, limited training took place for the first half of the year. Uh, we're back uh, doing a little more training now. You can see in July 36, August 28, and September 21, with a total of 169, we're generally well into the 200s. So that's it for training. <laughs> Under permits, uh, we don't allow open burning in July, August, and September. So we started up in October 15th and numbers are basically where they are from last year and previous years. That's it for permits. Mine's gonna be nice and quick for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, the quarterly three update for inspections. Um, property inspections year to date have been impacted again by COVID. A uh, limited number of uh, training events took place in the first half of the year, and uh, we started inspections now again uh, with the start of uh, mostly July, uh, August and September. You can see, uh, if you look down at the very, it kind of skews the numbers a little bit. Hydrant inspections, uh, 534. That's really good because this year we were able to get out and do hydrants because we weren't doing as, as many face-to-face -face inspections, so we got all our fire hydrants uh, done this year. Generally, that number is up over 700 uh, inspections a year to date. So that's it for inspections. Our public education, again, uh, impacted by COVID. We didn't uh, get out much in July or August. As you can see, September, we did a few, uh, with, starting with the schools, we did some outside events with our kindergarten classes. Um, a typical year is, we, we've only done 11, but a typical year is around 50. And that's all I have. That's a lot. That's a lot of numbers. <laughs> Thank you. Councilor Barkwell. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I remember years ago now, uh, there was a 10 year plan for the fire department. And I think that has, the, uh, has since expired, but I don't remember seeing a new 10 year plan. Do we have one for, you know, and, and replacement of capital and such? Thanks, Councillor, through the mayor. Uh, no, we don't currently have one at the moment. So it's something we can work on. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Question through to our new chief. Um, on volunteers, are we currently taking new volunteers because of COVID? Is that an issue? Um, people that want to volunteer and get trained up to be a volunteer is like something that's going to happen in the near future and do you have a waiting list thanks councillor through the mayor um right now where we haven't brought anybody on we have six members currently going through and i'll bring that up in tomorrow's budget through our uh, we call it our 1001 program through the firefighter program uh, we've kind of because of covid we had stopped practice uh, last year and we for the first half of this year so we are unable to keep the training going with them. So we're, we've, since June or July, we've started our training again. So we've, we're stuck in between uh, getting these six members finished versus bringing some more on, but we'll never turn anybody down. We'll always tell you, fill out an app. If someone comes to the, our door, we'll tell them to fill out an application and bring it back. And uh, we'll, we'll try to get them hired as well or as, as a paid on call as fast as we can, if we can do it. 
Thank you. Councillor Holmes. Thank you. Uh, so in the uh, public education portion, there's uh, under fire smart, there's an asterisk. I I'm just wondering what that represents. And, and then in general, where are we at with fire smart? So again, tomorrow I'll bring more of that up. We have uh, a budget for, for this year, uh, or for next year, a grant funded. I think it's a, no, I can't go with the number because I can't remember. But we are working with somebody to help us out build a program and also we're doing some fire smarting at the arena and putting it on our web page. Is that, I'm not sure, you know what, Glenn did this up, so I'm not sure what the asterisk is. We'll blame it on him. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll say it means it's important. Yeah, I didn't notice it, but it's got to be important. Yeah. I just have one quick question. The false alarm, or sorry, the fire alarms, um, I think it was 50 or something. Uh, does that include false alarms? Yes, that's every okay. time we get a residential or commercial building fire alarm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, uh, Graham. So just on the fire smart for council's awareness, we, so we are working with the consultant to do what's called the prescription for next year's activities on the fire smart. Unfortunately, we, we, uh, the grant money that was available has slipped because of timelines. So the, the work will still take place, but we won't have the same level of assistance as we had, at, at least for the upcoming year. But the prescription nonetheless is being done because the work has to be done and that is uh, underway. Yeah, I do believe there's like an RFP that's out for tender right now and I think it closes November 22nd. Okay, thank you. Okay, just so council knows, we are going to have a quick break before we go into closed, but we need some final comments from our CAO first. Thank you, Rob. Yes, uh, thank you very much. And so you'll notice we've added fire to the updates. Uh, now we also will be adding police. Uh, Sergeant Preston could not be here today, but so we'll, we'll have the police update, I think for the November 22nd meeting. But in future updates, we're going to try and incorporate fire and police into the quarterly updates as well. And then um, over time and, and where it makes sense, try to build in the operational rhythm, the financial updates as well into the quarterly. So just try and build the quarterly up to one large sort of dashboard that, that uh, council can view on that uh, quarterly basis. And thank you for council's time. We appreciate it. Councillor Holmes. Thank you, Graham. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be too bothered if fire and police were on a different day, just because it's pretty long haul doing this all in one go, but it's whatever works for, for yourselves. Okay, uh, it is almost quarter to four. Let's take a 10 minute, no, we still have item 8.1, sorry. Yes, we do. Thank you. Um, break just after this. It's uh, adoption, so it should be quick, of the Driveway Access Amendment Bylaw 2021-034. And to you, Kendra. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. So the Driveway Access Amendment Bylaw number 2021-034 received first, second, and third reading at the October 25th regular meeting of council. It is now before council for adoption. Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That the Summerland Driveway Access Amendment Bylaw number 2021-034 be adopted. Thank you. Seconder. Councillor Patton. All in favor? And none opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Kendra. Um, uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we have another public and media Comment opportunity? No. Okay. So 345, let's take a 10 minute break. Um, is five minutes long enough? Five minute break and then we'll resume and um, thank you. Uh, and then we'll be back for the uh, go into closed.